of, great, recording, of, um, what is the date today? The 18th, April 18th, uh, called to order. So first item on our agenda is actually the rules of meeting management from Vivian. If you could talk us through that, please. I sure will. Thank you, Sarah. And Devin, if you can just pull up the slides. Um, so my name is Vivian. Uh, my role in planning board meetings is to facilitate the public engagement uh, part of these meetings. And I want to really appreciate everyone from the public who is with us here tonight. And the rules I'll read are in place to find a balance between transparency with community members and security that minimizes disruptions. So there's no public hearing later in today's agenda, but there will be a public open comment. First, I want to know our, partic our participants to know that the city is really striving into a vision co-created by city staff and community for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. And this vision is really designed to promote free conversation and dialogue, while also recognizing that we want to make sure everyone who participates feels safe and welcome. And we want to ensure that we make space for different viewpoints because we believe it leads to more informed decision making. Next slide, please, Devin. And we have a lot more information on our website about our productive atmospheres vision if you're interested, but I'll focus on specifics for this meeting tonight. There are a number of rules of decorum that are found in the Boulder Revised Code, and we have some general guidelines that are advisory in nature to share with all of our participants tonight. We ask that all remarks and testimony raised be related to city business. We will not allow any participant to make threats or use any other forms of intimidation. Obscenities, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts the meeting or makes it uh, impossible for us to continue is prohibited. And we do also ask that participants identify themselves by the name they are commonly known by and to display their first and last name before speaking so they can call on you and so we know who is providing input. And if you're not sure how to do that, you can send me your, your full name um, through the Q&A and I can update it. Next slide. So we're in the Zoom webinar format and this allows participants from the public to speak at designated times and you can let us know by raising your hand, but we will not be turning on video for community members because of security concerns in this platform. Um, so to raise your hand, there's a couple of different ways to do this. At the very bottom of your screen, you should see a horizontal menu that has three clickable items. If you click on the hand icon, it will raise a hand next to your name, and we will know to call on you to speak at the appropriate time. Next slide. If you have an expanded menu, you can also get the raise hand icon by clicking on reactions. Um, and that concludes the rules. I think most people are, a lot of people are familiar with that. Um, so now I will hand it back over to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, all right, so Lisa uh, wrote to me that she's uh, waiting for her computer to update. Oh, so she will be joining us as soon as her techni technical issues are resolved. Um, so we do, as um, Vivian said, we don't have a, a public hearing today, but we still have our public participation or open comments period. So if anyone wants to speak on any topic for three minutes, uh, you are welcome to, you need to raise your hand uh, uh, technologically, and then Vivian will call on you. We'll have a timer, and at three minutes, we will ask you to complete whatever sentence you're on, and we'll move on to the next person. Yeah, thanks for that. So I'll just go down the list, and again, please watch the timer and be mindful of that. So we'll start with Rosemary Higarty, followed by Kimin Harmon. Uh, please go ahead, Rosemary. Hi, thank you very much for letting me speak tonight. I'm assuming you guys can hear me. Yes, yes we can. Great. Um, so I just wanted to speak to you about the changes in the, um, in, oh gosh, sorry, I'm tired at the end of the day, at, um, with the occupancy, occupancy limits and changing that from three to either four or five. Mm -hmm. um, I have really big concerns about that. And I feel like, you know, there's this huge push to increase density in Boulder right now. And I understand there's a lot of housing issues in Boulder, but 
I really think and hope that you guys will protect the neighborhoods, at least the ones that are closest to CU. Um, I live in a neighborhood that many of the homes are two, it's two bedroom houses, yet with the rentals, they're still at this point in time, you know, occupancy of three, you know, generally it's three CU students and they all have cars. And these are homes that have only space for two people parked in the front. Many of them don't have off street parking, or if they do have our off street parking, you know, it's one person in the house might be in their driveway. One person's in front of the house and the next, you know, CU student is parking in front of a neighbor's house all the time. Yeah. And so we already have parking issues with three people in the neighbor, you know, being allowed in households in this neighborhood. I can't imagine what it's going to be like if it goes up to four or five. So if you have to increase the occupancy limits, I really, really hope you guys will protect the neighborhoods closest to CU and not allow that to be increased in these close neighborhoods. If it's appropriate to have them in neighborhoods that have plenty of parking, great, and big houses, great. But this is not a neighborhood that that is going, you know, my neighborhood in Martin Acres does not fit that bill. Um, I also think um, the city of Boulder needs to look really closely at the fact that so many other cities that are college towns have these, you know, ordinances of limiting occupancy of non-related people. And it's, and it's for a really good reason. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to see these neighborhoods continue to be destroyed. CU is never going to stop increasing their student limits. But we keep having to make sacrifices for the quality of our neighborhoods because CU will not limit the amount of students that they're having, you know, that they keep admitting. And, you know, then what's the next solution? We increase occupancy to just free for all. I just think we need to really be mindful of what's best for the city and not what's best for CU. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. Next up, we have Kimin Harmon. Please go ahead. You have three minutes. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for allowing me to uh, join your meeting for this brief time. But um, I too want to address the occupancy limits. Um, I uh, live in uh, Martin Acres, and um, we have at least ten times the amount of student rentals compared to anywhere else in Boulder. Um, and that's due to the uh, proximity of the ever expanding University of Colorado. Um, I was looking at a map of occupancy that uh, the, I think it was the planning department uh, drew up and it um, shows that most of Boulder is occupancy limit is three. And there is a relatively small area that a very small dense area that has four. Um, so um, I think, you know, that to, to jump it to five would be crazy. Um, so I, um, so I'm just saying, you know, it's hard enough to live here with uh, three un unrelated people. Our houses are really close together. It's a tiny little neighborhood. Um, and a lot of us go to bed early. People have kids, there's families moving in here. Um, so it just would change the whole dynamic of the neighborhood. And as you know about Austin, Texas, they rescinded its high occupancy law. Um, because it caused so many problems. And, you know, if you're truly doing this to help affordability, it won't happen because the landlord will just charge per person, not a fixed price for the house like the old days. So we um, have to look at why you're really doing this um, and, and who it's going to help. And I think the ones that are getting help here are the landlords. So, um, you know, I mean, if you, you, like Rosemary just said about the there's others um, like peer cities that we have, and it turns out that 60% of them allow three or fewer unrelated people, and 23 of the 60 only allow two unrelated. So we're right within the norm for a college town. So obviously without occupancy limits or even higher limits it would be total chaos in a neighborhood like ours. Um, so the, the argument that Boulder's occupancy limits, limits of three unrelated people is somehow unusual or extreme is, is false. So um, I would just really encourage you, if you must raise the occupancy limit, to please exempt the CU adjacent neighborhoods from occupancy increases. And that's Martin Acres, Uni Hill, 
Bass Grove in East Aurora. We've all, we're taking the brunt of it. If you look at that um, over, or if you look at the occupancy map, you can see how you could spread it out to other areas around the city. But but please spare us our neighborhood. And if it happened to you, I think you'd be saying the same thing. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Lisa Spalding, followed by Valerie Stoiva. Lisa, please go ahead. You have three minutes. Uh, Lisa, I think you're still muted. Sorry. Okay, now? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. It's extremely difficult to explain the physical, social, and economic dynamics of a neighborhood adjacent to the university to who, people who live in other parts of the city. Some say they lived on the hill when they were at CU and it was fine. Others simply don't believe you when you tell them you were up until 3 a.m. while you waited for the police to shut down two very loud parties on your block and then spent the next morning cleaning up trash dropped in your yard. Please do not exacerbate these problems by supporting an occupancy increase in these vulnerable neighborhoods. The Hill Revitalization Working Group conducted a chronic nuisance data project last year that found one third of nuisances citywide occurred on University Hill. The Hill had 44% of the city's noise issues and 58% of the exterior property code issues. These chronic nuisance problems stem from the very high population density that currently exists on the Hill. We've heard the ludicrous claim that an increase in occupancy won't further harm the Hill because the problem isn't the number of people on a block, it's the noise, trash, and parking problems caused by these people, which can be taken care of by code enforcement. The city will never solve these problems through code enforcement because it will never have the budget for a large enough enforcement staff. Every year, a new group of sophomores move from the dorms to the hill, feeding the endless cycle of chronic nuisance issues. Young people are safer when they live around adults than they are in the blocks north of college that constitute a student ghetto. But adults are overwhelmed when occupancy spikes and the impacts become unbearable. Duplexes that were owned by permanent residents who rented out their basement are now purchased by out-of-state investors. Blocks collapse as investors renting to wealthy students take over more and more homes. The block of 10th Street between College and Euclid was largely homeowners and long-term renters. As investors paying cash bought up homes, the stable block became over 70% student rentals in less than five years. Raising occupancy limits would entice even more investors who could legally increase the occupancy and raise rents per head. An increase in occupancy would force the student ghetto to continue to creep up the hill. One size fits all plan to raise occupancy before you this evening will cripple the hill and other neighborhoods around the university. An overlay that excludes these neighborhoods from an increase in occupancy is the only way to save them. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, next up, we have Valerie Stoiva. Please go ahead and followed by Lisa Nelson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. All right, thank you. Um, so I too am speaking for the Hill and for CU adjacent neighborhoods. Um, I oppose increasing occupancy on the Hill. Uh, the city passed a revised ordinance and new trash policy. Uh, perhaps it believes the Hill is fixed. On the contrary, I feel that I am fighting for this neighborhood. I still call the police over noise and am losing neighbors at an appalling rate. Um, most people that I know plan to move away if things don't get better, quieter, if the traffic um, doesn't slow down. Um, less than 10 years ago, 10th Street, which uh, Lisa just mentioned, between college and Euclid was comprised mostly of owner-occupied homes and long-term rentals. Today, it has two fraternity annexes and many party homes. Um, most distressingly, a for sale sign just went up in front of a family home. 
So to my knowledge, only two houses are owner occupied on that street. Um, it would be nice if you could increase enforcement rather than occupancy. My mother joined forces with others in the 70s to limit occupancy. She was a social worker. Her patients were CU students. She acted out of concern for the welfare of the entire community. And I certainly share that concern today. The hill can be fixed, but it most certainly isn't. Please exclude it and other CU adjacent neighborhoods from the occupancy increases. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valerie. Um, Lisa Nelson, you have the floor, followed by Cecilia Gears. Hello, am I off mute? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate um, having a few moments here to just share some thoughts with you. Um, I am also commenting today about the proposed uh, limit, uh, raising the occupancy limits. Um, some of you might have seen my guest opinion in the camera last Thursday on the same topic. I did reside on the 1000 block of 10th Street for 30 years, so I know a lot about what happens there. Um, the reason I moved away, just so you know, is the day I decided to move away was the day that City Council approved the Marfa House conversion into luxury student rentals because that was the moment in time where I lost any hope at all that the city would do anything to prevent the complete demise and destruction of the neighborhood that I lived my entire adult life in, where the, my heart still belongs to, even though I cannot live there any longer. I served on every committee possible under the sun to try to get someone to care about this and do something. And I'm asking you now, this, this, it's, you have the power to say, no, we cannot fit more students into this neighborhood. It is detrimental. It is detrimental to the residents, it's detrimental to the community. It is detrimental and harmful to the students to be given the free reign in the environment that they have created in that neighborhood. And it is shocking to me that people would just turn aside and let a, one of our most treasured neighborhoods full of architecturally and historically beautiful structures just be abandoned to the profit-making motive of investors. I don't blame the investors. It's a smart investment because the city has never done anything to protect the neighborhood. Echoing our previous speakers, um, yeah, college towns have limits, occupancy limits for a reason, for a very good reason. Um, and I just have a quick story to share about this idea that somehow the, new, these, the ordinances are gonna fix this problem. I got a text on Saturday from a friend of mine who still lives on that block who was at her wit's end and asking me if I could help her. The students next door to her um, were occupying a house that previously had been lived in for 23 years by a friend of mine who had an artist studio in the backyard. The students who live there now, it's now a fraternity house um, and they've been blasting music day and night for the entire year. Well, it turns out that they are actually illegally operating a private gym with staff and um, paying members to come to their backyard and work out all the time. And they blast the music all the time. And these neighbors have spent the entire year pleading with these students to change their behavior and they get nothing but verbal abuse in return. And guess what? Has the city ever once, have they gotten a single ticket? Has the city ever even cared about this activity? You cannot say these ordinances are gonna fix the problems on the Hill. They're only gonna get worse if you hand it over to investors and students alone. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lisa. Um, next up, we have Cecilia who's joining us by phone. So I think you push star nine, Cecilia, try that to unmute yourself. Actually, I'm joining you uh, via Zoom on my phone, and I just found out where the unmute button is. <laughs> um, thank you, though. I am. Uh, th thanks for taking my comments. I'm here to ask that the planning board recommend um, an exemption to increasing the occupancy limits to the neighborhoods that we've just heard uh, enumerated. I live on the eastern end of Martin Acres. I'm a an eighth of a mile from Table, Ma Table Mesa Drive. I'm in a court that has 24 houses, 18 of these houses are rentals, six houses are owner occupied. Many rentals already have more than three unrelated persons in them. My concerns are that increasing the occupancy limits will increase the rentals here, the rent um, 
that the landlords are asking here, thus increasing more than four if that, it goes to four or five if it goes to five. Uh, in these houses, there's a bit of a litter problem. I'm continually picking up um, trash that's blown from my uh, neighbors on the western edge into my yard on, on trash day or other days. I'm picking up beer cans and other kinds of stuff that's thrown into my landscaping along the side of my sidewalk. It's kind of annoying, uh, actually more than annoying. I'm, um, I'm afraid that the intense tight parking will just become impossible. I mean, when I have my friends over, if I have more than one friend over, I'm always concerned that they'll have to park God knows where because Moorhead is, is completely uh, full of cars as is uh, my court. Anyway, um, lastly, my concern is that an increased occupancy in these four CU adjacent neighborhoods will continue to make them less of neighborhoods and more of locales for one to two year residents. Thank you for taking my comments. Thank you for being here. So last call, I don't see any other hands from the public raised. All right. Lynn, uh, Lynn Siegel just raised okay. her hand. Please go ahead, Lynn, you have three minutes. Yeah, this um, this situation is, yes. you know, this distinction between the, the state and the city, and we already have enough problems between the state and the city with CU South. This is takes us over the limit. Jared has gone too far. This is outrageous. We had bedrooms are for people, it, and I've had up to 17 people at my house at one time, living here, staying here, in years past before Airbnb dumped me. So I, I can appreciate it having, and I've always lived communally. I'd like to live that way, but this is outrageous. We already had the bedrooms are for people. We had a ballot measure. Where does the city of Boulder? We have, we have home rule. And you know, Jared says no limit to the city of Boulder. Didn't Carl Castillo from Inter Intergovernmental Affairs put some limit on it? You know, it, it, I mean, I don't think it's even relevant. I don't think it'll make a difference, but you definitely need to do something on the Hill. This the CU is insidious in their, in their constraints on, and their, their abuses in this city. And uh, it's outrageous that it should even be proposed that they can have no limit on University Hill. You've got to be bonkers. This is nuts. And yet, you know what? We don't have the choice because Jared can do whatever he wants. And who, who's this in, in intergovernmental affairs group that's making these amendments? Where did they come from? Where's this public input? There isn't any, because guess what? It's a democracy void when it comes to the city of Boulder and the state of Colorado trumps us. It's stunning. Um, this this whole package, I was just down there today talking to the folks from 3.30 to 5. Um, it's, it, uh, and I've got to see the summary still. It's been shoved on us instantly. There's no public process. There's no public hearings. There's, there's nothing. And, you know, Jared, maybe he wants to go to Washington, D.C. and run for president or something. But, you know, he's not going to get my vote. From Boulder, not that that matters to him. He's got higher aspirations. These people just, you know, will sacrifice anything to get a little bit better foreign policy in Ukraine, you know, or what have you. Um, it's it, it's got to be a radical change, and this is just horrific. This land use changes. I mean, but no limit. Single family residents, no limit. Four four plexes. Um, and nobody's going to build them anywhere it's expensive occupancy limit probably doesn't matter that much but it does on the hill so you've got to stand up for the city of boulder and its home rule and its right to have a public process on this thank you lynn very much thank you vivian is there anyone else last call no no other hands all right thank you all um lisa has been able to join us um all right, so our next uh, topic, our approval of minutes. Um, did everyone get a chance to read and send Devin any uh, revisions? 
Okay. Um, does someone want to uh, make a motion to approve the February 7th meeting minutes? I will move to approve the February 7th meeting minutes. Thank you. Anyone want a second? Second. Mark seconded. Uh, just a reminder, do we need to have a voice vote or just a hand vote? Hello, is a hand vote okay? Um, I think I would have to quick, you could, if you could just do a, 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 voice, a voice vote just in case, because I don't remember if it only applied to the public hearings, but okay. I'll look it up for Thank the you. next one. Glad I'm not the only one who doesn't remember. Okay, Mark? Yes. Laura? Yes. George? Yes. Lisa? Hi. ML? Hi. And Sarah, yes. And Kurt, I'm not skipping you, but you weren't here for those meetings. So don't take that for personally. Okay, so the meeting minutes from February 7th are set for approval. Meeting minutes for February 21st. Would someone like to uh, make a motion? I'll move to approve the minutes from February 21st. Thank you. A second? Second. Thank you. All right, uh, Mark? Yes. Laura? Yes. George? Yes. Lisa? Aye. ML? Yes. All right, so 5-0, I wasn't there and nor was Mark. No, nor was Kurt, I'm sorry, Kurt. All right, so both sets of minutes are set for approval. Um, we have no discussions of dispositions or call-ups or continuations and no public hearing items. Very exciting. Um, so what we have today are four uh, matters issues. Um, Thank you all for your flexibility yesterday in the agenda setting meeting. We decided to flip the agenda item so that we could quickly move through the nomination and appointments um, and then spend a little time digging into um, the, the matters that um, most of our the public spoke about today, which is occupancy reform and the separate matter of zoning for affordable housing. Just so you all know, we set aside 90 minutes for that conversation. Um, uh, if we need to go longer, we can, but just in the interest of time management. So the first matter, I think we need to hear from Brad to talk us through what this multi-board working group is, and then um, see if we can find someone who wants to be appointed to it. Good evening, members of the planning board. Uh, thank you for that uh, preface, uh, Chairman Silver. The multi group uh, working multi-board working group um, is a pilot project. It's uh, an effort to uh, bring a liaison from each of um, the various identified boards. I think there were 12 or so uh, together to have a single point person be able to represent um, in both directions information from that working group to the planning board and from the planning board to that working group uh, as a matter of efficiency so that um, these projects, in this case, Boulder Junction 2, are not um, mired down in terms of the overall time length for, for managing them by having to visit many multiple boards. Uh, so this person would be responsible for a meeting about every um, six to eight weeks. Uh, it's envisioned that this group would meet uh, possibly for up to 18 months, uh, although let me double check that, and um, again would be providing feedback to and from uh, the planning board regarding the Boulder Junction 2 planning process as, as it continues through in the next um, several months. So, hey Brad, can you just a little bit more about the this you know clarifying that it's not an advocacy role or a, but but a liaisoning role just like what are the what are the boundaries for that yeah that's a very important point thank you for um asking me to elaborate on that so this is uh not uh, looking to advocate any one position or another but rather to share information uh to the degree that the planning board uh wants to share feedback, of course, this person would bring that back to the working group and uh, it would be deliberated, you know, among that working group. Uh, but it is true not to uh, necessarily set this person up for either individual advocacy or, or particularly um, 
philosophical positions. And, and just stepping back a little bit, um, Boulder Junction, uh, many of you will know, uh, already has been through a planning process some 15 years ago. It was known as uh, TVAP at the time. Um, with the build out of the Western portion of the, somebody's going to have to help me with that acronym. I think it's Transit Village Area yeah, yeah. Planner. That sounds right. Um, with the build out of the first phase on the Western side, which eventually became known as Boulder Junction, Boulder Junction, um, it made sense to change this uh, nomenclature to Boulder Junction too. But fundamentally, it's an area that has already been planned. And the question that staff is working through is, are there areas of that plan that need to be re-examined given 15 years of time passing? And also just uh, lived realities in the area in terms of uh, infrastructure and um, some of the larger city goals. It is not a complete replanning of that area. Uh, but rather a, a step back in potentially tweaking or potentially just affirming. Uh, there is an intent to have the first part of this effort uh, done by the fall, which would be to affirm uh, whether there are any plan planning areas or, or to, to amend the plan. And then the second part of this would be to implement the plan um, through Rezonings potentially through engage, you know, additional engagement with property owners on specific design, that type of thing, um, similar to what happened with TBAP or Boulder Junction One. Um, do folks, if anyone has questions for Brad about this, um, now would be the right time to ask, and then we'll. All right, George. So sorry, I, I I think I just may need a little bit more clarity more than anything else because it it sounds like two things to me. So in the case that there was um, so so these liaisons from these boards are going to go into this super board and they're going to be talking with the city staff and either affirming or not affirming certain directions. And then you know what happens let's say if, if there are replanning, rezoning, those types of aspects, this would still at that point come back to the planning board. Is that, is that correct? Yes, the that? plan itself will come back to the um, planning board as well. So all of the mechanisms that are prescribed by code, uh, this does not supersede this. It is uh, simply a way to uh, facilitate what is, you know, by definition a cross interest uh, type of planning effort, um, but the actual any plan amendment would come to the planning board, uh, and that's is currently scheduled for late late what summer, it, early fall, and then any rezoning subsequently would be separate matters as well. So I'm I'm curious, and not to put you on the spot, I, but I'm just trying to understand. It just seems like it it comes across to me as another layer when everyone's going to have to go through all these boards anyways. Um, so I guess my question is, what are we hoping to achieve by something like this? And if if it is achieved, then would it be layered on to other things? I, I'm I just I'm having a hard time sort of computing. Yeah. What the benefit is? Well, for, first of all, um, this would not need to go to all those boards. So, for example, the advi environmental advisory board would not necessarily see uh, a plan amendment, for example, and, and they wouldn't necessarily see a rezoning. So planning boards are a little unique in that regard. Um, the goal is to prevent the, uh, uh, the, the tendency for those boards to be interested in this planning process and ask for an overview or an update and thereby having to go to, and I'm just looking at the list, you know, 12 different groups. And the sheer mechanics of doing that stretches out the process in a way that really is both inefficient and ultimately frustrates the overall process uh, goals, which is to try to do a tweaking in this case uh, of the plan, um, but not to make it a, a, a project and certainly not one that takes three or four years. Maybe I'm exaggerating there, but you know, two or three years because of just the mechanics of of needing to schedule multiple boards who have have curiosity about that and want an update, but but aren't necessarily formally part of the process. 
So this uh, multi-board working group is seen as a uh, coalition of the willing, if you will, to be informed and to inform their uh, their source board. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, George. Uh, Laura, you were next, then uh, ML, then Mark. Thanks. Just a, a couple that will hopefully be quick. Um, Brad, thank you for that update and uh, for briefing us on what we're here to decide. The Boulder Junction, am I uh, correct in, uh, in thinking that there is already a working group that it's like a citizen advisory working group for Boulder Junction that would be different from this kind of super board group? Yes, I don't I don't have the status of that at my fingertips, but yes, there, there's, I, I think, I think honestly, there are three different groups, and I'm sorry I don't have that memorized. But I think one is um, general citizens. Some are targeted populations. I think there's a group of business owners. Um, so there are technical advisory committees. Yes. Okay. And more, I'll just jump in and just clarify. They're, oh, they're focus. You. Yeah. No worries. They're they're focus groups actually. Okay. Um, so so quite targeted. Um, and seeking feedback at a, a couple different milestones. So very different from like the East Boulder working group, for example. Gotcha. Okay. I did not know that. So I know there was an application process for people who are interested in being part of a working group for Boulder Junction. I didn't realize it was more of a focus group. Um, and so would the board member liaison also attend any of those focus groups or they are just attending, it sounds like maybe three or four meetings over the course of the next 18 months, if it's every six to eight weeks and it's 18 months. If my math is right. Um, so bear in mind, this is the first time we've done it. So I can't say anything in absolutes, but it is not envisioned that there would be an expectation they'd go to these focus groups. I don't know that they'd be excluded. I, I imagine anybody from the public could be at some level, but, um, and thank you for chiming in Vivian. Uh, Vivian has been involved in some of the design of this and outreach. So uh, I'll, turn to her and ask her to keep me honest on any of my answers here. So thank you. So it sounds like the commitment you're asking for is three to four meetings over 18 months for this board supergroup. Does that sound about right? Yeah, as, as envisioned, I, I, it, it may be a couple more, you know, as we actually put it into practice. Okay. And I'm looking at the memo that you put together, which was very helpful. Thank you. And it says, um, the board members will attend meetings and represent the board's mission at the working group. Can you help me understand how representing the board's mission is different from advocacy? I just want to hear how you think about that. Well, it, it, it's true. That might be a difference without a distinction. Uh, if advocacy is uh, a focus on um, a you know, on a subject or on a discipline. Um, I think sometimes when advocacy is used, it, it means representing a uh, very specific point of view that maybe is at odds with other points of view. And uh, this, by its very nature, being a planning process, is about coming to planning solutions or, or planning vision, um, which is not uh, which is not the same as applying a strict set of policies to something. Okay, I'm just thinking about that. That's helpful. Thank you. I'm thinking about, you know, this topic did come to planning board a few months back, I think, where we, we looked at, you know, how staff was thinking about this process and what would be accomplished in the TVAP uh, 2 or Boulder Junction 2 phase, and we gave some preliminary input. So then am I understanding that the liaisons um, job would be to understand that past planning board input and interests in this area and represent that at meetings, or is it something different? Yes, yeah. I mean, we would expect um, that this person would be able and, and willing to represent conversations that took place by the planning board about this. Okay, thank you. Uh, th those were my questions. Thank you. Um, ML? My questions were answered. I was just about to take my hand down. Okay, uh, Mark. Uh, I just simply wanted to say that, um, so I was the um, planning board liaison to the design advisory board this year. And at the beginning of that term, uh, I had to represent planning boards views 
on the site review criteria to the design advisory board when staff was seeking their thoughts on that. And I just want to advocate that I, I found it invigorating to, we were in the board, our board was somewhat divided on should the criteria be more or less proscriptive, et cetera. So I think, um, anyway, I found it to be, uh, like I say, invigorating to advocate, not to advocate, that's the wrong word, but to represent the different views of the planning board to the design advisory board and try to do it in as way as fair and equitable as possible. And um, I think the design advisory board appreciated the input and a summary of the different perspectives. And I would imagine that this sort of role in the um, Boulder Junction 2 thing would be would be similar uh, in in that you know whoever takes this on would uh, do this seriously and fairly and and actually it's actually kind of uh, uh, like a good lawyer you know you you can ar argue either side of, of the uh, of the case so anyway I I, I found it to be actually uh, pleasant and so I would advocate that if someone has an interest in this that they take it up if they think they can fairly represent uh, uh, a disparate view of, of our board. All right, ML, you have your hand back up. And then I, George looked like he was gonna say something. So, okay, George will be next. Thanks, I do have my hand back up. Thanks Mark for prompting me <laughs> to get more specificity here. Um, thank you, Brad, for the information. Um, so my question is, Understanding the nature of the meetings themselves. Um, I It sounded like they'd be informational meetings, but by virtue of the title, it sounds like maybe they're actually working meetings where you're trying to solve a problem, not just get information on what's the status of the work. So can you clarify that, please? Well, I will do my best. Uh, again, with this being a pilot and a relatively new concept, I, I don't know that we can represent something with abs absolute certainty, but any group that is tasked with providing uh, feedback and, and information, it, it would be my expectation that there would be a good deal of informing, but also conversation among the group about any observations they have or suggestions. Uh, you know, whether that's 50-50 or 80-20, I, I couldn't tell you. So I guess I'll phrase the question a little bit differently. Um, I understand that that conversation goes along with information gathering just to make sure everybody's understanding and clear. Um, is there a goal for these meetings to come up with solutions of some kind or uh, that's the working component of it or is it about here is what we're doing and give us your feedback i would i would anticipate it'd be a bit of a mixture of both and again um you know the solutions in this case are are not starting from the null hypothesis right it's working off an existing plan and contemplating whether that plan still represents the current reality or whether there are aspects of it that don't and i think you know, this is where multidisciplinary feedback is is useful. Um, so the problem is one of potential, not of solving a problem per se. So it won't be easily defined in that way. Because um, it sounds to me like the uh, number of people at the at the group meeting is pretty large. There's at least what did you say, twelve boards plus whatever yeah. staff and whatever additional people um are these meetings like half day meetings i mean how how is how is it envisioned yeah again those logistics really haven't been determined yet but i would imagine a night meeting of you know maybe two to three hours not unlike a uh, uh you know planning board meeting but I, I would also anticipate some level of trying to get feedback from the 
folks who have volunteered as to what their availability is, but I, I don't envision these as, I, I don't think anybody has envisioned these as retreats per se, mm -hmm. you know, that scale. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Right, George. Um, I, I, I didn't really have a question. I have more comments, so I'll, I'll save it for clarifying questions at this point. Okay, then Laura, your turn. Mine is also a comment. George, okay, did you want to go? Have, no, I have a question. I have two questions actually, and then we'll go back to clarifying comments. Uh, so my first question, I think it's basically trying to just pinpoint what ML is getting at. Is this going to be a decision-making body? Yeah, and and I. I apologize for the vagarity of it, but I, I just don't know um, because it's again being piloted as a, an effort to have a multidisciplinary work, working group. Um, again, I can't envision having a conversation without people uh, providing feedback, but it is not an ultimate decision making board. Those are going to be the uh, strict decision making uh, authorities that already exist under code, which is planning board and council okay so then my second question is given the 18 month framework or minimum of 18 month framework someone like me who's only going to be on the board for another 12 months would not be an appropriate uh person you want someone who's going to be there over the the right you don't want someone who's got to switch out next march is that correct? yeah I, ideally i would say that's true okay. but we also need to be realistic in knowing that during that time frame people may you know, move or whatever. And so I can't. No, no, I know, but you're trying to understand that. But there, the yeah, first, the goal is to have is that you're on planning board, but but then there's this time frame and just wanting to yeah. make sure that you, one of your yeah. objectives is someone who's going to, who can carry the baton through from beginning yep. to end. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's very helpful. No, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. That's a good okay. point. Okay. So let's go back to clarifying comments or questions, uh, George and then Laura. So um, my, my clarifying comment is going to be kind of counter to Mark's, which is, it, this seems wholly different than working as a liaison with DAB or liaison with Landmarks or something like that. Um, this almost puts 12 boards on equal footing um, to get solicit some kind of input and listening device. However, planning board is quite a bit different than the majority of the other boards that were participating in this, in that these things are going to come to us either way. Um, I might recommend that planning board doesn't get involved with this, that we wait for this board to actually get updated because we're going to see this either way because our voices are so different and disparate. Um, and I think important and the detail is important for, for one of us to come in, listen for three hours, give our peers a five minute update only to have this come to the planning board anyways and represent our peers back. It just, it seems pretty challenging. Um, and considering that this would be coming to planning board where I don't know of the other 12 boards, how many of those 12 boards would even see these things. Um, I, that would be something I'd want to be taken into consideration, uh, just cause I, I, it's hard for me to really understand how it would function effectively specifically related to planning board. I, yeah, I would say, you know, that certainly is the board's prerogative to not appoint somebody. Um, you know, there's, there is this concept of everybody knowing everything all the time and whether there is some benefit of having a person be a quote unquote expert about a particular topic um, on the understanding that uh, individuals uh, on the board who wouldn't be as engaged on a regular basis wouldn't have that same level. And so there'd be that opportunity for information sharing and a certain level of familiarity that, that the rest of the board wouldn't have when it comes time to the plan uh, approval. Um, but at the same time, of course, as a board, you are asked to vote on things with, um, you know, relative uh, same amount of information for quasi judicials. This, this is not quasi judicial, right? It's, it's legislative in nature. And, and so that, that might be one perspective, but certainly if the you know, the majority of the board does not want to, or nobody wants to volunteer for it, that would be your prerogative. George, you want to do a follow-up or no? Uh, I mean, you know, in this case, the, the board isn't a whole lot different in our role than like a city council and they're not on this board. Um, so I would, I would put that out there as, 
as something for us to consider that these are these are quite a bit different boards than our board uh, and we're gonna we're gonna have this run through us one way or the other so just just a thought i, I i'm i'm open I, i'm not locked into that at all I, I just wanted to put that out there as as a concept for all of us to consider thank you okay laura um I think George raises a very interesting point and and Brad had some very interesting uh, responses to that. I also don't have a firm position. I, I've just started thinking about this um, since George raised it. The comment that I was going to make, which might or might not be related, is that I think this is a very exciting concept, um, especially pulling in some of these boards that don't usually get to have a say in, in land use matters, you know, like the uh, Human Relations Committee and the Water Resources Advisory Board. Um, I see Parks and Rec is on here, as well as open space. You know, the, the, this area, Boulder Junction, is pretty different from a lot of Boulder. Uh, it's uh, a part of Boulder that some people find extremely exciting and uh, kind of paving a path of a different kind of living in Boulder. And it's a part of Boulder that, uh, that some people find uh, not very attractive or it doesn't it doesn't resonate with them and so I think having such a wide representation of our different boards and the different things the perspectives that they might bring to this is a very exciting prospect and I think having those different boards hear each other and talk to each other is something that we don't often have an opportunity to do I do think that planning boards perspective on long range planning matters is unique and I think this could be a very interesting venue for interchange for staff to listen in on that dialogue and weigh the different perspectives of the different boards in the same room I think it's very exciting, but I also appreciate the challenges of this as a pilot project. I appreciate staff's um, boldness and creativity here in trying to make this work. I imagine there may be some tweaks to this uh, going forward. Uh, I'm inclined to say I think this would be exciting for one of us to be involved in and that the other boards could benefit from hearing planning board's perspective and vice versa. Um, but that's that's kind of my initial pass at it. I'd love to hear what other people think. Um, Lisa, do you want to say anything? Lisa, no, she's got. Kurt, do you want? Do you have any comments you want to make? Well, I had some of the same concerns that George just expressed. That it seems like planning board's role is extremely different um, than the other boards. I also agree with what Laura was saying that getting the input and feedback from these other boards and communicating to them, other boards that wouldn't normally see this, is is great. Uh, speaking personally, since the planning board has already had some consideration of this, when I wasn't on the board, I think I would not be the most appropriate representative because I wasn't present for those discussions. So I appreciate those comments. And, and I guess for me, um, so myself, Mark, and now Kurt, has, who has self-selected out, the three of us would not be appropriate or eligible. Um, I have, I guess for me, it, when I first uh, heard about this, and read the memo that Nuria sent out, um, I guess my, what I'm challenged by, I, I, sh I understand what Lisa's saying. I mean, not Lisa, Laura, I'm sorry, Laura, um, that it's an opportunity for individual members of each board to share perspectives or share the, the frame of reference that has to be applied through their board. Um, at the same time, I always thought that was the role of staff to know what the, the staff represents, the staff from each, who, who staff each board knows what it is that they have to evaluate, which is why when we read like a site review, you have comments from board me or staff members from transportation and construction and design and open space and, you know, parks and rec and whatever. So I, I I'm... I too have a, I realize the pilot, but I too have concerns that we're kind of in an effort to, to alleviate some of the work staff has to do to present to all these boards. We're creating other work for staff and sort of doubling up what they have to do in terms of bringing the perspective of their particular expertise to the board. So, I think it's six of one, half dozen of the other. I realize it's a pilot. It's going to move forward whether we suggest somebody to join the board or not. Um, uh, I think as long as, so so. I guess if, the, if there aren't any other comments, and Lisa, you have not said anything, do you have anything you want to add to this? 
I'm sorry, was that directed at me? No, Lisa. Oh, I'm sorry. Lisa, can you hear? I don't think she can. Oh, so do you have any comments? Anything you want to add? Sorry, what, Sarah? Do you have anything you want to add? You haven't said anything. No, okay. I don't. No, I think everything that's coming up is consistent with kind of the questions that I had to reading through this portion of the packet and thinking about it and just trying to understand, you know, what the goal is of it. So nothing, nothing particular to add. Okay. So I guess uh, in order to decide if we want to appoint someone, if someone wants to, wants to be appointed or to choose to do this, first, we have to sort of answer George's question. Do we think that someone from planning board should be part of this uh, super group? <laughs> I don't know what else, this, oh, large working group. Um, is there anyone- I'll weigh, I'll weigh in briefly on that, Sarah. I mean, it seems yeah. like if it's moving forward, if there's someone who's willing to put in the time toward it, that it would be good to be present, even if we're not entirely sure what it's gonna be. Um, so unless unless nobody, and, and this is fair too, but unless nobody really wants to put time toward it, I think it'd be nice to have a presence. Um, so I think that depends on if, if anyone wants to volunteer. <laughs> so is there anyone who feels strongly against our participating? All right, I'm not seeing any thumbs up. Okay, so now it's who who has the time and the inclination and the interest to uh, do this for the next 18 months? Can, can I make a suggestion, Sarah? Yes, of course. I think we're also gonna talk about all the other liaison assignments. And my answers to that question would probably depend upon whether I have the airport and some other assignments or if there's been enough room for me to do both, or, you know, like I, I need to know what my other assignments are before I could answer that question. So does it make sense to roll this into looking at our other assignments? That's fair enough. I, I Laura, I hope you won't take what I'm about to say personally, but the airport liaison role you're playing is very important and it's a very big development, uh, land use development project. And I think it would only be fair to ask someone else who is not already part of a very large scale project to be the representative on this working group, uh, just so that everybody gets the opportunity to kind of dig in deep and chew on um, these kind of um, deep processes. And I absolutely agree. I would totally step back if somebody else wants to step forward. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm, I think it's fine for us to try to figure this out in the in the context of the other board um, assignments, but this does seem, this one is a lot of time um, and something new. And I, I, to me, it's a priority, given that it's a priority for the city manager and for the planning staff. So um, I personally think, it just, it's just my personal feeling that we should make this decision and then go to the other um, like let let that drive everyone else's assignments to choices. But Mark, you had your hand up. Did you want to offer up an alternative? No. Okay. Um, okay. So if Sarah, Mark, and Kurt are not uh, are self select out from being eligible, Laura's going to set herself aside for now. It's ML, Lisa, or George. Do any of the three of you have a particular interest in doing this? ML's a no. <laughs> Lisa's a no. So George, are you a yes or are you also a no? Uh, I, I'm, I, you know, I kind of, my position is kind of this. I, I, I think this is coming to planning board anyways, and I, I got, a, I got plenty on my plate. So no, not, not particularly. Okay. Well, that then leaves Laura or Kurt. And Kurt, do you want to un, un, separate yourself or un? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the word is. I'm looking for. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do think that it would be important to have someone representing and so if, um, <laughs> if it's down to me, I guess it's down to me. <laughs> um, and Laura, again, it's not, I'm not trying to, it just, it doesn't, are you okay with someone else? I'm with you 100%, Sarah. I understand your logic and I support it. I think Kurt would be an amazing representative. And I, I don't think it's that important, Kurt, that you weren't at the previous meeting. I think you can read the notes and talk to us if you have questions. And I think that our, our input was pretty um, straightforward. All right. Congratulations, Kurt. You have a new assignment for the next 18 months. <laughs> okay. Well, thank um, you for that thoughtful discussion and, and feedback. I appreciate all that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so Brad, don't go anywhere because now we nope. have to do the um, other liaison assignments and we are not sure if we have the full list. We're using the list that Mark sent around a few weeks ago. Let me just read through the boards that we think- We, we maybe have. also get that up if there's a way to get the list up. Um, Debbie, yeah, we are, we are just discussing that right now. So Devin, okay. do, you, do you have that availability? I think Devin's going to screen share with us. Yes, absolutely. I can get that pulled up. And here, as, as we wait for that, I think uh, not to put you on the spot, Helen, but I, Helen might have more history with this than uh, I know I certainly do. So uh, to the degree we have questions, I'll ask her to help weigh in too. Yeah, and I, I was just looking at the code there, a couple of positions that the board has to appoint uh, based on the code, it's the, um, a member that's appointed to HAP and a member that's appointed to the Landmarks Board as non-voting members to those boards. Um, and in light of that, I, I would recommend that you make appointments with a motion and to make it efficient, you might wanna figure out all of your appointments and then do one motion to approve it all. And have any of these wrapped, are these all still ongoing? East Boulder Working Group is over. Um, I don't even know what the code amendment group is. What is the code amendment group? I think it's Carl's fault. Is Carl here? Carl? Yeah, it's Lisa and Amanda. Right. Well, that's the use table liaison. Well, that's the loose use table liaison. No, there's a, there is a separate use table liaison. Yeah, I see it now. Uh, so just to make think, to take one thing off the table, I think it makes sense for ML and myself to continue in the use table process because it'll wrap up in the next year and um, it doesn't require anybody getting up to speed um, if that's okay with folks. Okay, so that solved that problem. And I agree with Sarah, the East Boulder Working Group has concluded and that line can be deleted. We don't need anybody there. Okay. And Carl, start, sorry to call you up, but whenever Carl might step back in, um, if you are away, Carl, if you wouldn't mind speaking to the code amendment group at some point, just to remind us of that. I, I don't think we've actually technically met, which is fine, um, but I just want to make sure we understand the scope of that and, and where it's at. I, I remember talking about a code amendment group, I mean, I think probably several years ago. I think it was mostly just to have some contact with the planning board to let them know what was coming down the pike. I don't know that we've necessarily seen a need to meet since we've been uh, meeting with the planning board on a number of occasions. Yeah. Uh, I think Should we just strike that it. then as a as a group or, or do you feel that it's something we need to keep as an appointment or? Maybe when maybe if we discover we need it, we can make an appointment. Totally. Okay. Or I mean, I'm happy to stay on there, but you're probably going to want to also assign me to something else, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, what about Greenways Committee? Is that still happen? Does that still exist? Uh, not to my not to my knowledge. I haven't. I heard I was going to get to go to a once a year party, and it never happened. <laughs> uh, excuse me. I I, I want to ask about Greenways. So did in the uh, 22, 23, April to April period, did, um, George, did you not go to a, a Greenways meeting? That as far as I, I was, I was never uh, notified of any Greenways meetings. Yeah, that's, that, that's too bad. I, I was the Greenways advisory, um, Greenways liaison from TAB for two years and we met both years, one meeting a year. And um, I was uh, both glad to be part of that because I think it's important and disappointed in that we only met once a year and it was a drift without really a distinct staff liaison. And um, anyway, so uh, I, I wouldn't, I, I would suggest that we not cross that off our list, that in fact, uh, the last meeting I attended, which was the prior year, there was a um, uh, discussion about having greater staff involvement and Joe Tadeucci kind of was said, I'm gonna, this is important, I'm gonna 
take this up and you know i guess other things got in the way but um anyway i would recommend that we not that we appoint people and not remove that from our list um I, that's i think that's fine but maybe staff can tell us if it even still exists let's start there I, I unfortunately do not know for sure. We can find out. I would, unless other staff does know, I would recommend appointing a person and we can follow up. It, okay. It's in the code. I mean, it's it's like we we didn't remove it from the code. I, I'd be I'd be happy to stay on just because I'd like to I'd like to participate at some point. <laughs> Me too. I'd be delighted to stay on there. And I know code amendments not group working, but I'd be happy to stay on that in case it gets reactivated. I'll also offer just speaking for myself individually that I've already served on both Landworks and Housing Advisory Board. Um, and so I'd sort of maybe recommend those for some of our new members who haven't had the opportunity. Um, but you know, yeah, that, that's just I have, also, I have also served on both, and I know Laura just served on um, landmarks. Let's let's do this, okay? So we have the use table folks, we have greenways. Now let's just go from the top to the bottom. Landmarks. Uh, okay, Laura, can, Sarah, Sarah, I'm sorry, I'm I'm being really anxious here. Can we start editing? Like, can we delete East Boulder Working Group I'm, and put I'm, the? I'm writing things down, and then. Oh, we'll, okay. That's okay. So we're not we're not doing it on the screen. Uh, oh. We can we can do it on the screen. We can try it? to do that. Devin, I, do you have the ability to edit this document? No, that's a screenshot. That's a screenshot. Yeah. Oh, okay, that explains why it's not happening. Okay, I'll try to release my anxiety. Release your anxiety. <laughs> You're doing great. Now. Have, a, have a shot of vodka or something. <laughs> I, I have we're a little caffeine. Meetings. Caffeine I just will work. Covered this. It's so okay. sad. Okay, um, Devin, uh, please don't feel like you have to, but but if if it's possible to add, it could just be like a line and not even necessarily in a table. But if you have the opportunity to kind of take notes as we move through these um, within this doc, that that'd be nice. But don't you know? Don't make yourself too crazy. Oh no, absolutely. I'm gonna. I have. I'm making notes as well, and I'll, I'm gonna send out a, a revised table for everyone once this is finished. All right. So landmarks board currently it's Laura and ML. Um, Emma, uh, I've served on it uh lisa served on i've served it, on it too and george has served on it so ml do you want to move up and be the primary where is ml i've lost her i can't see you here i am um i'm i'm desiring to be on design advisory board okay that makes it easy okay so that means so let's ml is going to be the primary for design advisory board uh just to finish dab is there someone who would like to be the second on dab i'd like to be if um but I'm, I'm open to someone else taking it too i haven't been involved in it yet all right i'm just going to write your name down for now we'll go through and then we'll see um let's go back to landmarks um who would like who hasn't served on landmarks i'm raising my hand to acknowledge i haven't served on landmarks <laughs> i i i might want to be the backup but I'm actually holding out for to be the primary on housing, but anyway, to answer your question, I have not served on landmarks. Okay, and Kurt hasn't served on landmarks. Um, so before we move, so Kurt, do you have a Laura? Do you have a preference for what you would like to serve on? And Kurt, do you have a preference for what you would like to serve on? Well, I, I think that, you know, uh, Kurt just took Boulder Junction and I've got the airport and both of those will be pretty busy. So, uh, you know, Landmarks, I think, is extremely interesting. Um, it only meets once a month. It is usually a long meeting once a month, but you don't have to really do any prep. The staff do a really good job of walking you through so that you can understand the decision that they're making and the criteria that they're using. I do think it is relevant for planning board members to understand how Landmarks works. But Kurt, didn't you serve on Landmarks board in the past? So Kurt is very familiar with the process and, and how it works. Um, I, I would prefer to move on to something else just for my own learning. <laughs> right, Laura, um, is, if I, if I were going to pick one, I probably would pick housing, but I don't feel super strongly about that. I, I'm not gonna arm wrestle anybody for it. Um, wait, would Mark, would you be willing to be a second to Mark? On Absolutely, housing? yep. Okay. So I'm, I'm just writing this down. These are not commitments yet. I'm just writing this down. Um, so really all that leaves is landmarks and um, let's see, 
who doesn't Lisa doesn't have a lead, but you've already done landmarks. I've done landmarks. I'd be fine if we need me to go somewhere else, though. I could certainly serve as backup. I just prefer not to be primary since I've already done it. Um, but if you need me to fill in backup on landmarks, I certainly can. Okay. So um Kurt, are you at all willing to do be the lead on landmarks? Yeah, I was sort of hoping to be backup on landmarks, uh given maybe you guys uh, could go back. Sounds... Maybe, you guys, maybe you guys could switch off. And that way, nobody has to go to twelve. Wait, Mark's Mark's uh, Mark's Mark's raising his hand. All right, I, I'm I'm feeling bad here. I I was <laughs> back up on housing. I got to attend several of their meetings, and um, you know, I we don't want to orphan the landmarks board. So uh, if it if it works out for everyone, I'm happy to take the lead on landmarks and uh, let housing go. Okay. So then if that's the case, then Laura, would you want to be lead on housing and Kurt, your backup on housing? I mean, is I there some- I, I was going to be backup on landmarks was my understanding. All right. Okay. Let me do, put you there. Hold on. This is this is a bit like- um, Three-dimensional you're just, chest. You're doing great. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> is there somebody else who doesn't have a primary assignment? Because I do have the airport working group, yeah. which is so me, pretty active. Let me, let me tell you what I have at this point. Use table is Sarah and ML. Greenways is George and Lisa. Dab is ML and George. Uh, Landmarks is Mark and Kurt. And then Hab is to be named, an, a, a, a free agent to be named later, and Laura. So what we don't have is a lead for Hab. Wait, I, I thought Laura wanted to be the lead on hand is that i i could be either but if there's somebody else who doesn't have a primary assignment and would like to be the lead on hab i'm happy to step back sarah are you not going to take a lead are we thinking that use is <laughs> lead i mean we both do the same I've thing done, on use I've but i'm wondering oh got it hab and i've already done land, landmarks uh and um i think i have my hands full with um this role so Laura, do you want to be lead on HAB? And then Mark, were you were you back up on HAB this year? I was back up on HAB, but John and I, due to travel, I ended up attending several. Well, why don't we why don't we make you um all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest something, which is <laughs> which is that Mark be lead on HAB, Laura be back up, and that Kurt be lead on landmarks and Mark be backup. And then we've got it covered. Um, and I know Kurt, you've already been on landmarks, so it's not exciting and new, but uh, is that okay with you? Well, if, if you're, um, I was actually thinking that even though it wasn't my initial thing, I would take the lead on landmarks with Kurt being my backup, since he had just taken on this other role. Okay. Laura, who has a strong interest, take the lead on housing with Kurt. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Just anyway, with, with someone as her backup. And that would that would solve it. Who Lisa. Does Lisa have a Lisa? I don't, but I've served as lead, I think, before on both landmarks and housing. Um, and I've also, yeah, so it, it's, I can take a lead, but I'm also serving as vice chair. So I, I'm not particular. So would you, Lisa, would you take the backup on HAB? What I, about, I hate to volunteer, George. George, do you have any interest in HAB? Have you served on it before? Would you want I to be backup? I have not served on it. Um, I could, I could be, I was, um, yeah, I could be, I could be backup on HAB. That's fine. All you're right. so engaged, Laura. You're all you're gonna do it anyway. So um, <laughs> I'll well, be your knowing backup. that knowing that you're the backup, your backup. I would feel more free to miss a meeting. <laughs> so, Devin, let's see if we have the same thing. Sarah and ML for use table, George and Lisa for Greenways, ML and George for dab. And then I, I, I yeah, I'd, I'd um here's what I'd like to do then. I'd like to drop off being the backup for I'm sure someone will will happy to do that and maybe 
put my hat in the ring to be the lead on DAB next year rather than that. Right, so let's just do this. Let's for right now, ML for DAB, we will figure out the backup at a later date so we can actually get to uh, the real work of the meeting tonight. HAB will be Laura and George and landmarks will be Mark and Kurt. And I don't mind being back up on DAB, having For now. that if, if ML can't attend, that's that's fine. I can I'd be glad to attend. Great. Okay. Sarah and I was going to say that I able. could also be back okay. up on DAB if need be. Okay. Second Sarah and ML. Wait, wait, wait. Stop. Time out. Sarah and ML for use table, George and Lisa for Greenways, ML and Mark for DAB, Laura and George for HAB, Mark and Kurt for landmarks. Okay, so that's what Devin has. So now we just need to wait for Devin to put that up on the screen so that someone can make a motion and then we can- Can you send it to him in an email maybe, Sarah? Unless, Devin, do you already have it written down? Do you, did you... I, I do not have it typed out, but I will do that right now. Okay, wait. Oh, right. and, and I would submit that we, we don't have to have it in front of you for you to vote. You, you just list it. So <laughs> we need to be organized. Yeah. Would someone like to make a motion on what I just verbally stated in terms of appointments? Sure. Um, the motion, motion would be, can we uh, go ahead and make it um, approve the appointments that we all just discussed? Does someone want a second? Second. All right. Laura, yay or nay? Yay. George? Yes. Kurt? Yes. ML? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Mark? Yes. Sarah is a yes. And um, with that, I will, Devin, I will email you my notes. And we have accomplished first two of our four items. I'd like to make a suggestion that we take a quick five-minute break. Come back and we will start to dig into occupancy and um, zoning zoning changes for affordable housing. Okay, we'll be back in at seven twenty one.
Carl, are you in your office? I am, yes. Wow. One of the offices. We don't really have offices anymore. We just kind of hop around. Oh, really? Is Hoteling. <laughs> Is that like a, pol a city policy now or just? Yeah, I mean, there's no assigned offices anymore. So you just sign out rooms wow. when you come in. So do you, is that, do you find that efficient? Uh, it's it's okay. I mean, there's certain days when a lot of people come in, so then it's like hard to find a room. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have, you know, three floors in the building, but so we all can't necessarily be in the same place mm -hmm. if we all come in. But overall, it seems to work. We have kind of more open meeting spaces too, which we didn't have before. Okay. So, you know, there's pros and cons, but overall pretty good. Which building are you in? Are you in the one next to Mustard's Last Stand? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is that called? Park, Cent Park, Park Central? Park Central, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mustard's Last Stand actually predated Park Central. There's like, like old pictures here where you can see Mustard's and no Park Central. Wow. I read somewhere that it was somebody's home as well as business. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I, I've heard that too. Some old timer. I'm trying to remember where I saw that. Uh... <clears throat> oh, I know, I know. Somebody, uh, we were talking about um, the hospital site and somebody was explaining the history of Park Central. Yeah. And apparently a bunch of buildings that were built in the floodplain back in the 60s, 70s. Yeah. I think I just saw that Mustard's extended their lease, which is exciting. I need to give them a visit. I have to say, I've actually never been to Mustard West End. They have the best tempeh burger in town. So if you know, if you have vegetarian friends that want to have a temp, a good old fashioned tempeh burger, Mustard's. Also a really good tofu dog. Do they? <laughs> or they used to, yeah. You wouldn't think that Mustard's would be like a primo place for vegetarians, but you would be wrong. Mm. I have to say, I'm old school Chicago style hot dogs. Mm. What is Chicago style? Is that like mustard and onions or something? Well, so it's kosher hot dogs on a bun with poppy seed. No, with um, yeah, poppy seeds are the black ones, right? Poppy seeds uh -huh. and onion, mustard, onions, pickles, or peppers, mm -hmm. and ketchup. It's kind of what mustard ketchup. advertises itself as the um, <laughs> Chicago style dog. I before think they, they have a sign up there saying ones. that you cannot have ketchup on a hot dog, but that's not allowed. Because they're but mustard. Crazy. No ketchup. Maybe yeah. kraut, though. <laughs> Purple oh, yes, kraut. kraut. I'm sorry, you're right, Mark. There's sour kraut as well. I, know. <laughs> I forgot the sour kraut yeah. part. Okay, uh, so George will come back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're just missing George. He, okay, and he'll come Car back. Carl, before you start, just so you know, we, you're not in presentation mode. You're in. Um, we we can see all the menus and everything. Yeah, yeah. I'll get it started once. Okay. Start. okay. Thank you. Yeah. And Sarah, I messed up the voting rules. And you have the general or 1987, <clears throat> um, and they allow voting by voice, raising of hands, or roll call. But during the virtual meetings, when you're um, reviewing an application under Title IX. It requires a roll call. Okay, good to know. All right. If I don't remember that from meeting to meeting, please don't take offense. I may ask again. Yeah, no problem. Okay. All right. So it is uh, 724 according to my phone. Um, so we're going to start up again. And we are now doing the, uh, the matters, which is an update and request for feedback on um, two work program priorities. One is occupancy reform and the other is zoning for affordable housing. Uh, Carl is gonna walk us through both and stop at certain points for questions, comments, feedback. And we have scheduled 90 minutes for this. If we need to go over, we can, but since this is primarily feedback, we don't have to debate amongst ourselves about what to do or how to vote or anything like that. So Carl, take it away. 
All right. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, board members. Uh, like Sarah said, I'm going to talk about two of our uh, planning and development services work program uh, priorities from city council. So that's occupancy reform and zoning for affordable housing. Uh, this is in addition to the ADU uh, project, which you, you're already familiar with, and you've already uh, made a recommendation on that ordinance. So these are the two other housing-related land use code changes that we're working on uh, that was asked of us from council at their retreat in 2022. Um, not to mention that there's also changes happening with the inclusionary housing uh, regulations and program being done by Housing and Human Services, but the ADU and these two um, land use code changes are the housing related ones that PNDS is, is managing. So um, obviously there's a lot to get through tonight. So I'm gonna try to walk you through this uh, the best I can. Um, the purpose of tonight is really just to bring uh, planning board up to speed on these two particular projects uh, and then to get feedback on uh, where we're headed based on discussions we've had with city council um, on this already. So. Just the basic structure of the presentation tonight, I'm just gonna start with just a basic background on how the project started, uh, occupancy and zoning for affordable housing. And I know I usually end on schedule and next steps. I'm gonna move into the schedule and next steps first, just to give you a lay of the land as far as the timeline we're on. Uh, it's a fairly uh, quick timeline. So we're trying to keep Carl, code changes uh, relatively Carl, simple. Carl, can we interrupt you? Uh, we're, we're not seeing the slides advance. Uh, it looks like it's locked up in presentation. Uh, okay. So we're still on the title slide. Let me stop share and share again. It, it was advancing for me, so. Thank you, Brad. I was going to say the same thing. Can you see this? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. This will make it easier that you can see it. We we see your notes and the next slide also. So it's still not in presentation mode. Gotta love Zoom. Gotta love it. <laughs> Do we though? Do we have to love it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we just have to love each other and put up with Zoom. Interesting, yeah, for some reason it's not. Do you see it now? We see the title slide and we see your slide deck in the left-hand okay. toolbar. Yeah, it's like, it's totally working for me, strange. Let me... Is this something that um, uh, someone else can help you with while you're presenting? Or or we can just suffer through as as long no, as your notes don't say, hey, skip this slide so that Mark doesn't talk endlessly about this thing. <laughs> oh, I want to see that. <laughs> yeah, I'm hitting to start the slideshow and it's All right. Do you see the title slide now? No, we see purpose. This is crazy. Now we see the title. Carl, I'm trying to open it. Do you want me to try? To share? Um, sure. And you can just say next slide if you want. Sure. All right. It's consistently so mean to you, Carl. Zoom is very unjust. How does that there look? There we go. You got it. See the title slide. All right, you want me to move forward? Ah, uh, yes, please. Thank you, Sloan. Sure, this happened. Sorry about that, everybody. I don't know what, I've never had that issue before. We blame Zoom, we do not blame yeah. you. Thank you. So you can see like parts one through five, there's a lot to cover. Um, so I'll, I'll start over really quick. So I'm gonna start with the background of the two projects and then I'm gonna go to the schedule and next steps, uh, just so you understand uh, the schedule we're on. Um, and then I'm going to pause on the part three, which is state legislation on land use. I know that's kind of an elephant in the room at the moment because this is a relatively new thing uh, that came along um, since we started these two projects. So just to talk about that. And then I'll move into part four and part five. So part four is going to really cover occupancy 
So I'm going to talk a bit about the history of occupancy in Boulder, uh, what our current standards are, what other communities are doing, um, and then we're going to pause just that for just basic questions at that point uh, on the regulations or other communities. And then I'm going to move into uh, community engagement, talk about the options, the potential options that we talked to council about and what council's direction was. And then we'll we'll end that section with planning board feedback on occupancy. Um, and then similarly, we'll move into zoning for, for affordable housing after that discussion. Uh, I'll talk about what we mean as affordable housing for this particular presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about how residential density is calculated in Boulder. Um, and then again, we'll pause for questions because um, it is uh, complex. Uh, and then I'll talk about community engagement again, uh, the potential options that we presented to council, the direction we got from council, and we'll conclude on uh, feedback from the board on that project. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. So um, starting with occupancy reform, uh, this is the retreat direction we got from uh, this council on in 2022. It was basically to perform a comparative analysis from other communities, develop a model occupancy approach, and solicit community input uh, for ordinance revision. So from that, we've also um, come up with these goals of the project. So um, you've probably read them in the in the memo, but in general, like we're trying to look at simple land use code amendments that can provide greater housing opportunities in the community while preserving neighborhood character uh, in established neighborhoods and vet changes with the community. So again, both these projects are growing out of the housing crisis uh, that Boulder and a lot of uh, the nation is experiencing right now. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give a heads up of, of the kind of questions uh, we're going to ask the board tonight, I'm going to go through the first part. And then the first two questions are, are there any questions on the city's occupancy regulations? Uh, and then does planning board have any questions related to the, the general project? And then I'll, I'll go on a little bit further. And then the third question will be asked about uh, what's the feedback the board might have about the options that council wants us to uh, do further analysis on. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, moving on to zoning for affordable housing. A slightly different project. Um, it's basically evaluating the land use code with the intent of removing zoning barriers to more affordable units and smaller modest sized units. Uh, this was also brought up at the 2022 retreat. Um, again, looking at um, areas that might make sense to try to um, change the zoning to encourage more small units uh, and with that getting more deep restricted affordable units. And I'll go into more uh, details about that. But there's been a lot of uh, materials, uh, things online related to zoning where there are simple changes in the zoning code that could actually get more um, housing and get more affordable housing in the communities and uh, related to density calculations or parking um, or things like that. So uh, we've been uh, doing some research and I'll present those tonight. So and the next slide shows the same relative questions. Uh, First, we'll start with the questions one and two, like are there any questions about how the city regulates residential density, uh, anything, any questions about the general project, uh, and then I'll talk a bit more about the options and the feedback, and then we'll ask for feedback from the uh, planning board um, on what we've uh, heard from council. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as a schedule, um, we've been moving forward with uh, community engagement over the last few weeks since we've had study sessions with city council on these topics. We've been reaching out to a number of different stakeholders throughout the community. We're developing a, a Be Heard Boulder questionnaire that relates to both uh, projects. Uh, for the public watching out there, we're hoping to get that up in the next couple of weeks. Um, that's just gonna have some questions and uh, the ways of getting feedback to the city. So that's at beheardboulder.org. We're going to be putting that in the newsletter and I'll be emailing that out to anyone who's like contacted us on these projects. But you can see that the um, the goal is to try to complete occupancy reform by August, bringing an ordinance to council and completing zoning for affordable housing in September. Uh, so that means a planning board will likely be seeing um, an ordinance and making a recommendation on occupancy reform in July. Um, and then uh, the zoning for affordable housing in August. 
Uh, we, we are going to be trying to get feedback over the next few weeks, uh, do some more analysis on the options, and then uh, convey planning board and housing advisory board and community feedback to council on June 15th. And so that's the general schedule that we have at this point. Next slide. So before we move forward, I, I wanted to talk about uh, what's been going on at the state level. Um, originally, we weren't thinking that we would have to spend too much time on this, but it's been kind of developing over time. So uh, you might be aware of Proposition 123 that passed in November of last year um, uh, statewide. It basically created a state affordable housing fund, similar to how you know Boulder has an affordable housing program just for Boulder, and it does dedicate state income tax revenue roughly $290 million a year to fund housing programs in a variety of different ways uh, throughout the state. And that's, you'll remember that the, the governor brought up housing as a, as a major issue at the state of the state uh, earlier this year. And then just a couple of weeks ago, uh, a draft of a new Colorado Senate bill, 23-213, uh, was unveiled that relates to land use uh, statewide. So it would basically be uh, something similar to what has been seen in West Coast states like California, Oregon, and Washington, where um, if passed, uh, it would be a bill that would require uh, some local communities to, um, uh, it would, would impact zoning regulations basically at the local level. So what's proposed right now is um, a prohibition on occupancy limits entirely. Um, an allowance of ADUs on any lots that permit uh, single family homes uh, without any discretionary criteria, uh, and also allowing up to uh, what they call middle housing, or what we, we've been calling missing middle housing, up to quadplexes uh, by right in single family neighborhoods. Um, so these are pretty, um, pretty bold changes at the state level. So it's something that we're, we're monitoring. We don't know exactly where it's going to land. Uh, we did, do know that the Senate uh, has started deliberation about this today, or it might have been the House of Representatives. So it's possible that this could be acted on in the next few days to, to uh, weeks uh, going into May. So we are monitoring this. Um, I think our, our goal at this point is to still move forward on these particular code change projects as we were and try to still get feedback on this, but understanding that while we might be down the road of making these changes, we will probably have to make, um, if this passes, more land use code changes down the road uh, to be consistent with whatever passes. Uh, the, the latest bill basically says that cities have till uh, June 2025 to update their land use codes to comply with whatever passes. Uh, and if they don't comply, they actually will have a model code that they're going to bring through a public process. And if the cities don't update their codes, that model code from the state would then apply in the jurisdiction. So that's kind of where we are right now. So I thought we should stop here and happy to answer questions. I can't say I'm totally an expert on it, but I've been uh, in some meetings and reading through the legislation and uh, we're happy to help out with this part before we move forward. Um, Kurt. If I recall correctly, Prop 123 included some requirements also in order for local jurisdictions to receive the, the, the money, the Prop 123 money. Do you know, first of all, is that right? And if so, do you know the status of the rulemaking on that? I'm not familiar with, with all those details related to Proposition 123. Um, I don't know if anyone from if Sloan from housing is um, aware of that or Brad or. Uh, I'm happy to let Sloan go first. I, I can report about the rulemaking, but Sloan, you might be more familiar. Um, so some of the rulemaking has been done. Um, probably, Kurt, what you're referring to is the um, expedited review process. Is that what you're referring to? There's also some other um, standards you have to meet. In terms of the expedited review process, that has been, um, it's not a requirement until the next session or the next um, compliance period. So as part of this, what, you know, the next three years we're going into, that won't be a requirement, but it would be for the following one. 
And then I, in terms of the other, um, the other measures that were required, um, we've determined we think Boulder is probably already in compliance with that, so it won't be as big of a change. Okay, so it doesn't really interact at this point, at least with this current effort. Um, not Proposition One, Two, Three. Um, the only way it would interact, um, not so much with occupancy, but in terms of the zoning um, for affordable housing changes, we will need to meet that 3% goal if we decide to opt into the program, which we are planning to do. So um, any opportunities for us to increase housing and thereby increase affordable housing as part of the inclusionary housing program would help us to meet that 3% goal. So it's not directly related, but it, it does help us meet the intent of Proposition 123. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Did I miss anything, Brad? <laughs> we... No, no, that's great. Thank you. Shall we move on? Let Kurt, Carl, I mean, Kurt, Carl, 20 Ks, Carl, please move forward. Ready to, to move forward? And uh, so, no, any any questions on the latest Senate bill? Okay, next slide, please. And the next slide, thanks. Um, so I'm just gonna jump into the history of occupancy in Boulder. Um, going back in time, uh, before 1950, uh, the zoning ordinance that we had at the time did um, basically just state that every single family home would be would just be limited to a family. Uh, during the 1950s, it was updated uh, to be a family or five unrelated persons. And then in 1962, it was amended to be family or three unrelated persons. Um, 1971, uh, it was basically the same, but they, they added the provision where, where within a single family home, uh, you could have two additional rumors, uh, which is what's in our code today. Um, in the 1970s, there were a number of rezonings that took place, uh, particularly around like the downtown area. So like on University Hill, Goss Grove, Whittier areas um, were originally a high density zoning district that permitted um, apartments and, and a number of uh, attached housing products. And it was a lot of them were rezoned to, to more only allow uh, new single family. So uh, it did change uh, the occupancy in those areas. So we have even today a lot of non-conforming occupancies in those areas just by virtue of the fact that more units were permitted in the past. Um, so what was done is during the 1980s, we actually had zoning inspectors going to all these units and, and cataloging how many non-conforming occupants were in each of these units. And we still consult these records today uh, to determine what the allowable occupancy is in, in these particular areas. Um, in 1993, the council at that time actually eliminated that practice and changed the code so that all the units would have to meet the new occupancy standards, which, as you can imagine, got a lot of pushback from landlords, you know, where they all of a sudden had, you know, empty units that they couldn't uh, rent out. And I think over the course of the next few years, that pushback led um, another council in 1998 to reverse that. So we've gone back to that practice of using the records for each of the properties that have non-conforming uh, occupancy. So no other changes for a while until about 2017 when the special, uh, when the cooperative housing units were updated, uh, they added um, special occupancy regulations for co-ops. And then when the ADU update was done in 2018, uh, that was also updated. Uh, so next slide, please. So just basically, um, the city of Boulder regulates occupancy very similar to a lot of other communities. They do use this, the definition of family, which is pretty common uh, throughout the country. So there's no limit on the number of family members that can be within a unit. It's where you get into like number of unrelated where um, the occupancy rules really uh, kick in. So uh, this is a brief part of, of our section of the code. So it's basically members of a family plus up to two additional rumors like I talked about before. 
And there's basically two just two different districts in the city. There's the lower uh, density residential areas, like the, the single family neighborhoods, the RL zones, RE, RR, as well as public and agricultural that allow up to three unrelated persons per unit. Uh, and then all other zone districts that are outside of those areas uh, allow up to four unrelated uh, persons per unit. Um, and then we also have the fourth provision, which is two persons and any of their children by blood marriage, guardianship, um, including foster children. Or, in, uh, or adoption. Uh, and then we have, we do have special uh, allowances for like group living uses, which are typically allow, you know, six to eight occupants, which is pretty, again, common across the nation uh, for more institutional uses. Uh, the co-ops is like 12 to 15 occupants um, if they get their approval through uh, licensing. Uh, ADUs are pretty much the same Occupancy limit for a single family house. The only difference is that it allows the two additional roomers basically can have uh, dependents with them. So it's a little bit more flexible. Um, next slide, please. So the next slide just shows a map of where you can see the, the orange is the most um, common limit throughout the city based on the single family zoning districts. So that's where you can see most of the city is actually limited to three per unrelated persons per unit. Um, the green areas are the other zones that are generally more high intensity or commercial zones that allow uh, four unrelated per unit. So next slide, please. As far as uh, recent local developments, I think you all are aware of the bedrooms are for people ballot measure. So this was, uh, I think it was 2021, uh, where there was a, a referendum or ballot measure uh, to change our occupancy regulations to be basically the number of bedrooms plus one. And there was also a new definition of bedroom added um, in that proposal. Um, it was a close vote, but it didn't pass. It was uh, 52 against uh, 48 for. Um, there were some surveys that were done in the community that showed that there was still a lot of community interest in changing the occupancy regulations. So I think this is what prompted Council to ask us to to look at maybe some other solutions that were different from the bedrooms or people uh, ballot measure um, in order to add some more flexibility uh, with occupancy to uh, you know attain more housing opportunities in the community. So we did discuss this with council at a study session in November of last year. Uh, council expressed that this particular project was one of their highest priority items. Uh, they did want it to be. Uh, passed as quickly as possible. Um, we, we've proposed to complete it in quarter three. They've asked us to do it faster if possible. Obviously, this is well before like the state legislation, so we do have to kind of sit back and see what that does. But uh, they've asked us to, to do an engagement level of consult. Uh, we have been reaching out to a number of different stakeholders, but at our last check-in with council, they did ask us to kind of broaden the scope of how many folks we're speaking to. So we're setting up meetings to talk to a, a wide range of folks in the community on this topic. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna go over uh, other communities very briefly. If you're really interested, I, I encourage you to go into um, the links to the council study session memos where we have attachments that go into a lot of detail about uh, the communities we looked at. But we looked at 60 different communities uh, throughout the United States. We looked at all their family definitions. We looked at their occupancy limits in single family zones. We looked at their occupancy limits outside of those zones. Uh, we looked at a number of the different ways that they regulate occupancy. I'd say for the most part, they're, most of them are similar in terms of how they do it. Um, the numbers of unrelated that they allow, there's, there's a range and we had some tables uh, in, the present, in, in the packet that show uh, that Boulder kind of falls somewhere kind of in the middle. You know, we, there are communities, um, maybe 50% of communities have, allow more, uh, but there's a fair amount that, that allow less. Um, but they, they go about it in some different ways. They have different, dif different definitions of, uh, or variations of co-ops, functional fam families, things like that. So if you're interested, I encourage you to take a look at that, those materials. Um, like I said, uh, California, Oregon, and Washington actually has state legislation that makes occupancy um, prohibited in local zoning. Um, so those states now do not have occupancy limitations. So those cities don't have them. 
Uh, Minneapolis has recently elected to eliminate their occupancy uh, regulations. Uh, some, some have reduced occupancy limits around their university. I know we heard some of the public comments talking about that. So an example is Austin, Texas or College Station, Texas. Um, some have increased occupancy allowances around their university. So uh, Charlottesville, Virginia and Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, we also looked at Madison, Wisconsin, which was interesting because it was a, basically it's a three unrelated limit throughout the city, but single family areas were limited to two unrelated, but you could go up to three unrelated if the unit was owner owner occupied. Uh, but while we were looking at that, uh, we found out that they were actually in the process of changing their occupancy regulations. So they've actually, like Denver, have changed their requirement to be five unrelated citywide. So that's fairly recent. We did uh, talk to the, the planner uh, who worked on that, um, and that's a pretty recent change. Um, so next slide, please. I think we're to the first question. So any questions about the city occupancy regulations or anything relative to the overall uh, project? Mark? Seven ML. Um, Carl, uh, thanks for that. So currently, our occupancy limits are enforced only on a complaint basis. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, that's my only question. Thanks. ML. Can I elaborate on that real quickly? Yes. Yeah. Um, that was initially instituted in, <clears throat> as I understand it, in, as a response to COVID and more recently has been continued uh, due to staffing limitations, but we do anticipate that changing in the next year. Okay, great. I, I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Brad. So during COVID, we only enforced it on a complaint basis, <laughs> but going forward, we would revert back to some other method of enforcement. Can, could you describe that? So occupancy enforcement is notoriously difficult, um, as I explained to people. It's uh, still often because of a complaint. Um, in other words, uh, a neighbor is concerned about the number of vehicles or activity level or intensity of use. The inspector goes, investigates, knocks on the door, says, how many folks do you have? Um, we invariably have to take them at their word at some level. Uh, but then do enforcement based on that. Sometimes uh, it also can be the result of known advertising and those types of things as well. We, we you know, we may discover it through those means, and we do have some level of active uh, awareness of um, what's being uh, advertised for, you know, rental in case of rentals. Um, the opposite, of course, is not acceptable, which is. Uh, you know, somehow doing sweeps of houses and and going room by room to count number of people. So that obviously is impractical. Um, so most jurisdictions um, acknowledge that the enforcement is going to be um, a, a challenge, but like other laws, uh, most people choose to follow the law. And uh, I, I always say like jaywalking, just because it's not something that you necessarily have uh, locks, you know, rock solid ways of doing enforcement it still is an important tool for um, uh, having in, in the legal toolbox and support. Great, thank you. Mel? <clears throat> thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> so I have um, on on number one, I, uh, just a clarification. So we limit occupancy based on the dwelling unit itself and zoning, regardless of the size or number of bedrooms. Is that correct? That's correct. And second question there, um, given the research that you looked at on the various um, jurisdictions, where there are no occupancy limits, was there any data on the impacts of not having any occupancy limits, like before and afters and that sort of thing? 
Some of them are relatively new, so we haven't been seeing too much data on that. Um, I have spoken with a number of different planners um, in areas where they've removed occupancy. They just had anecdotal uh, comments that there hasn't necessarily been an increase in impacts, um, that they're, they're, they've mostly just been focusing on enforcement of, of any kind of issues, what, whether it's related to a, a number of occupants or, or not. Um, they just focus on what those externalities are, like if it's parking mm -hmm. in the wrong place or a couch in the front yard or, mm -hmm. you know, things like that, that may not, may or may not be attributed to occupancy, but we've not seen anything at this point that speaks to an increase in impacts. Uh, I mean, how old are the, uh, the ones that have, who's had them in the longest? Is, is it California one of the ones that have had them in the longest? And isn't that a number of years? Yeah, I think I, I did talk to some folks in California. I'm, 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 I'm reaching out to a number of, of different folks on this topic. Um, I don't have a good answer. It's, I know Minneapolis was, has changed it relatively right. recently. Right. Yeah, so I guess that's my main question insofar as is the project itself is, are there any implications to removing occupancy? Um, I know we're talking about increasing it, but the state is talking about removing it. And, you know, are there any real issues that come as a result of taking that action? And it sounds like you don't have any information on places that have done that. Is that correct? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think in my conversations that I've been having with planners, it's been that, you know, just because a city removes the occupancy limits doesn't mean that all the units instantane instantaneously have all of a sudden more people in them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to take some time to really understand what those implications are. Um, I think some of the research that's been done in other communities like Denver is that, you know, despite increases in occupancy or, or allowances for, for removing the limits, you know, the averages for the number of people and units has stayed relatively the same mm -hmm. um, in the data they've seen. I mean, that could change over time, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you, Carl, for that. Okay, so I think it was George, then Laura, then Lisa. Yeah, and mine should be uh, pretty quick because uh, it's a follow on to uh, ML's question about data. I, I saw her question also asking about when you talk about impacts, were there any impacts to affordability one way or the other? Or do we have data on that? Because implied in a lot of this presentation is that there's something there, but is, do we have any actual information? Uh, I, I don't have any data at this point. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Laura, then Lisa. I think Lisa was ahead of me if you want to go first, Lisa. Sure. Um, and I, I might break my own rules, but I'll try to be relatively quick. So I guess one of my first questions is kind of, in, and some of this might be some of the state legislation that's coming down the pipeline, but one thing I would wonder about is like the freedom of landlords to like decide, you know, who they want to rent to. I guess they could still choose to rent to like a family or, or to a group of students, you know, on the Hill, you might prefer to rent to a group of students because that's who wants to live there and isn't going to be mad about noise and will pay more in rent and, you know, so on. So I, I just, that's one of the things I think about, you know, is, is what kinds of um, legal decision-making depending on, on what we do as a city and also what comes, what the law that exists and also it comes from the state, you know, as far as people who own property deciding who they'd like to rent to without discriminating. Um, and then also, as, as I recall in planning school, a lot of these occupancy laws came about specifically in um, cities and towns with universities. Um, and that was what drove a lot of this, although there were also racial and other reasons um, why this came about. And so that's just something that I know we're not drilling back into the full, I think it was March 9th memo or like all the details around that, but that's just something I think about is, you know, we we've certainly seen plans come up usually more for apartments or units rather than a house but you know if you can cram 10 people in and I'm not saying that that's what they're trying to lift it to they're trying to do it four or five I just wonder about how that impacts certain parts of the city um you know in ways that it might not impact others you know yes okay that's still illegal or you know would be against regulation to have that many people in but is it then that much easier to put more people in because now you can have up to this number and anyway I don't want to get too down that rabbit hole because there are some houses 
on the hill that like have two kitchens and have a higher occupancy, but that's something I worry about specific areas. And then um, I think just my last question off of um, kind of what other people have been asking about is just interest funding and people to like deal with the externalities. Cause we say what we really care about is cars, you know, being parked inappropriately or trash or like whatever, you know, how do we enforce those things instead, which I am actually pretty amenable to, but like, I just wonder like, is this, is this being coupled with any way to manage potential externalities that arise out of that? Or is it just kind of like lift it and see what happens? Um, which worries me a little more. So I don't know that those, I think some of that's back in March 9th, but those are the things I think about with this, even though in general, I, I think anybody who wants to break this rule right now can already do it. So it's a little bit silly to have it on the books. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in our discussions with enforcement staff, you know, there, there have been some complaints that come under the title of occupancy, but it's really related to noise or it might be trash in the front yard or parking, you know, things like that. So they kind of address those directly. I, I think um, they've noted the challenge in really trying to understand. I've, I've heard this from other communities too, just it's very difficult for them to really uh, like know for sure how many people are actually living in the unit, who's just hanging out there for the day or, you know, things like that. I think a lot of the other communities that I talked to struggled with that, particularly Madison, because that, that's why they, um, they didn't, they couldn't ask for any legal um, information that proved that it was owner occupied, occupied to allow, like it was difficult for them to get that legal documentation so it just became an ongoing challenge. So do you have a follow-up? Okay, Laura. Um, I have a couple, but I will just throw in on that last point to say, I remember being a student as I'm sure most of us do. And I'm sure it is quite difficult to know who's just crashing somewhere or staying over with a partner or a friend and who actually lives there. Um, I had a question which was raised by a, a comment letter submitted by Plan Boulder. And they pointed out that in Denver, when they raised their occupancy limit, they talked about the definition of a household. And rather than looking at a family, they talk about a household is people who live together as a family or the functional equivalent of a family who share household activities and responsibilities, such as meals, chores, rent, and expenses. And the members, this is, I think, is the most important part of what they were trying to get at here. The members of the household choose who is part of the household, not a landlord, property manager, or third party, which I think is trying to get at this idea of investors from afar creating a rooming house rather than a group of people choosing to live together uh, as roommates or as housemates. And I just wanted to know, have staff looked at that option and how it's working in Denver and what do you think of that one? Because I had not heard of that before. Yeah. And I'd be interested in your analysis. I, I did read that and it it prompted me to to reach out to the the planner who works in Denver who who actually did the occupancy update. So I, I wanted to get clarity on that issue. And he he acknowledged that they put a definition in the land use code that's called a household, which is kind of similar to like what we saw in some other communities that say functional family, like there's other different ways to um, catalog it where, you know, it, it adds a, another layer of, you know, if there's the most extreme enforcement case, they would have to demonstrate to the city that they are indeed a household. Um, but he did acknowledge that there, there are some holes in that, like it still would be difficult um, to, um, have them demonstrate whether they've agreed to live with each other or not. Um, but it was something that they felt through the, you know, compromises made in the process of updating the code that that should be in there as an extra tool. He said that they've, they've not had to actually take any enforcement cases uh, with that term into account uh, lately, um, but it's something that they could fall back on. Uh, but again, not, not with a lot of teeth. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I know that we have talked about this in the past. A, a lot of our commenters tonight were asking for an overlay that would exempt certain neighborhoods from the any change in occupancy regulations. C can you just remind us what what is staff's analysis on that and why is that not staff's recommendation? We had included it as an option, which will be the next part after these questions. Um, 
more just because like we're trying to like you know keep this as simple as we can there's an interest in keeping it simple and not having areas being treated differently but um we would have to create you know maps or some sort of appendix map that would apply different rules compared to others uh, other areas uh, it doesn't mean it can't be done we, we we did discuss it with city council i think there were three council members that were interested in that option but it wasn't the majority of council um, so we haven't been focusing on it but we have been hearing it obviously um, from folks in you know martin acres and uni hill and goss grove things like that so i don't know we're going to go back to council in june um, we'll we'll raise that as feedback we've been hearing uh, it's possible that council could still ask us um, to develop that thank you Anything else, Laura? No, nope, that's it from me. Thanks. Um, so this follows up on um, Laura, uh, Lisa's question about externalities. I, do our occupancy regulations have touch on parking at all? Uh, they do not. Okay. And but, um, didn't Austin reverse its occupancy increase? They it wasn't necessarily reversed. So I'm, I'm going off of just a conversation that I had with the Austin planner about it. Uh, what he told me was that the rules of occupancy, the, the higher occupancy that was around the university had been in place for, for a long time. Again, I'm going off of what he told me. And that, but during the course of that time, there was a lot of duplexes that lined the university um, I think they called them, what was it called? Super duplexes or something where it allowed up to 12 students in each duplex unit. So you'd have like um, 12 in one building. So over time it, it built up and it became a problem. And then that's when they, you know, they had those zoning areas that had those duplexes. Um, they reduced the occupancy. So it wasn't necessarily, from what I heard from him, that they didn't increase it and then then suddenly decrease it. It's just that it had grown over time, it had become an issue, and then they they changed it to reduce the occupancy. But they kind of had to respond to a situation on the ground around the university. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, does anyone else have questions, or shall Carl move along? Looks like Carl's taken away. Okay. Next slide, please. I don't know if uh, Sloan, are you able to advance that? Or, okay, thanks. All right, so I'm going to talk about community engagement thus far on occupancy. So obviously, uh, occupancy has been a community discussion topic for many years uh, in Boulder. We've been trying to get the word out on this latest project through our, our newsletter uh, and the city website. Obviously, the ballot measure um, from 2021 has brought interest back to this topic. Um, we've been reaching out to a number of different groups from neighborhoods to students to renters uh, all over the city um, to get their viewpoints. We did hold an outreach event on February 22nd that tried to bring some of those key stakeholders together uh, and talk about all the housing related code changes um, that are going on in the community. So next slide, please. Wait, Carl, and what kind of what kind of are you finding people are showing up? Yeah, I mean, we had um, over 30 uh, attendees at that meeting um, in February, um, and we, um, we're going to continue to have virtual and in-person office hours. Um, um, we, we've had a number of different meetings um, with like the Hill, Plan Boulder, um, University Hill Revitalization Group. We're, we're going to be meeting with some student groups uh, in the next couple of weeks. So we're just trying to get the word out and we're Again, like I mentioned, have the Be Heard Boulder questionnaire sent out to a whole bunch of folks. Okay. So as far as those that are speaking in favor of increasing occupancy limits, um, a lot of folks feel that it would add more affordable housing opportunities for those that are struggling to find housing or struggling to stay in Boulder. 
um, that the changes would be consistent with the city's housing and racial equity goals. Um, there are some that have been noting that the potential impacts of increased occupancy are not demonstrably more than uh, what, uh, what could actually come from just a large family living within a unit, uh, and that if there are any impacts, whether it's a large family or a number of unrelated, that um, those would be di directly handled through enforcement. Um, obviously, uh, it would help students be able to live together to deal with the higher rental costs, um, reduced violations if, if occupancy is kind of removed from um, the categories of, of, of an issue. Uh, and that it would just ultimately, if by adding the number of units, it can address the increasing cost of housing in the community. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, those that are opposed to changing the occupancy limits or are more cautious of it uh, indicate that um, their viewpoint is that increasing housing supply alone will not make a difference, that the demand to live in Boulder is so high that ha adding housing will only add more uh, expensive housing, and that um, if landlords are allowed to have more occupants within their units, they're just going to allow more people and charge the same or more rent because people are willing to um, to pay that rent. So that um, that's a concern. Um, rather, um, some find that the city should just really focus more on increasing in lieu uh, cash in lieu fees, commercial linkage fees, or look at other ways of getting deed restricted and affordable units. Um, you've, like you've heard tonight, there's some that feel that um, certain neighbors, neighborhoods should be exempted out of any changes um, and that there are concerns that increasing occupancy limits will increase enforcement burdens on neighbors. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as the, I'm not gonna go too deep into all these different options that we presented to uh, council, but these were derived from looking at the other Sample communities, um, option A was to increase the maximum number of occupants in all zones by one. So in all the areas where it's three, it could go to four. In all the areas that are four, it could go to five. Uh, option B was to increase it to four or five unrelated citywide, um, only allowing an occupancy increase in single family areas um, within owner occupied units like, like Madison. Uh, options D and E were to only increase occupancy in areas that are not single family zones or not within single family units. Uh, option F is the one that relates to any kind of overlays or mapping solutions that uh, would exempt out uh, certain areas from an increase. And option G was no change. Uh, next slide, please. So when we presented this to, to council, um, most council members were generally on the same page. There was some diversity in opinion. Uh, there was majority support for increasing the occupancy limit per unit to four or five citywide. I think a number of council members uh, showed a preference towards four and a number showed a preference towards five, uh, but they wanted to get more engagement on that to, to see what resonated with the community. Uh, so eight supported moving forward with option B. Um, one member didn't support increasing occupancy um, against the will of the voters of the bedrooms uh, are for people um, ballot measure until the city were able to develop a well vetted option and then actually put it out for the community to vote on uh, rather than council taking action on it. Uh, like I said before, three expressed interest in option F, which was to exclude some university ad adjacent neighborhoods, but they were not uh, part of the majority, so the focus has been on option B. Um, I'll also mention that some council members put out an option Z, which was get rid of occupancy altogether, kind of like what the state uh, legislation uh, is saying. Um, they asked us to reach out to uh, more people in the community, really try to get perspectives on people that uh, might be struggling to find housing, really um, talking to the student populations or other folks that um, are like work in the community and aren't able to live here or can't afford to stay here, uh, those people should be included. They've also asked that we uh, talk to our community uh, connectors and residents group, which we're planning to, to meet with on this topic. Uh, and then uh, a couple council members also brought up just the family definition, see if they're, make sure the, the community is aware of, of what our definition is and whether there's any um, folks in the community that think that it should be changed or modified. So we will be 
uh, educating people on, on how our code works today. So I think that concludes this section. So next slide is the um, question for planning board. So what feedback does the planning board have uh, regarding um, basically option B and any other feedback that you wanted to provide tonight? So uh, my recommendation is uh, that since again, it's not a dialogue or discourse between us that um, it, if you raise your hand, just go through the things that you want to give feedback on to Carl and we'll each go through and give feedback and that'll enable us to wrap up and move on to the next the next uh, item. So ML, it's your turn, you go first and then Kurt and then Mark. Thank you. Um, so Carl, I have um, three feedbacks. Um, one is, would, would you be giving council information on option B that um, spoke to, um, would option B result in more people being housed? I mean, that's the point of all this, right, is that we're trying to get more people housed. And would you be going back to council with that kind of information that increasing the density four to five occupants? Is that gonna house more people? What have the cities that have done these changes given us? Is this gonna actually do what we want it to do? So that's one piece of feedback. And I guess it would be about um, what information city council would be getting. The second one is, um, is there is there going to be, I think I saw somewhere, um, uh, infrastructure capacity that would be tied into the occupancy? Will there be any of that kind of information going to city council if we if they go with option B? Is what kind of impact might that have on infrastructure? And is the city capable of, of meeting that? Um, and then lastly, uh, by changing the occupancy up up to four and five, would there be any value in addressing what the community has stated as one of the big issues with um, occupancy, which is parking? Would there be any value to attaching parking requirements to occupancy? And those are my three feedbacks to um, to option B and what information might be useful for council. Mel, thank you. We can always uh, circle back around. Um, I, did I say Kurt was next? Kurt and then and then Mark. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I do support increasing the occupancy limits uh, somewhat. Uh, to me, the primary benefit is of how uh, improving housing security for people who are already living over occupied, which I think is quite a few people in, in the city. Unfortunately, we don't have very good data on it, but we do know that there are a lot of people who, who, who are living over occupied, who historically we've had a bunch of cases of people living over occupied, whether they know it or not, and then you know losing their housing when, when enforcement happens. And so to me, that's the primary benefit of, of increasing it. Um, I, I do just anecdotally, it would be nice to have better data on this, but anecdotally, it feels to me like in the area where there's high demand for rentals, especially around the university, most of the bedrooms are occupied. Uh, you know, again, legally or not, there, there might only be three people on the lease, but I think there tend to be more, uh, if it's a five bedroom house, generally I think it's rented to five. I also anecdotally, I feel like most students as these days are not really interested in sharing a bedroom. So I, it seems like a five bedroom house doesn't get rented to 10 people. Uh, so, so, uh, so to me, the I guess the bottom line is the maximum number 
is not so critical. It's more determined by the housing economics and by the actual housing stock that we currently have, which are kind of fixed. Uh, the other thing that, that I would say is I certainly am sympathetic to a bunch of people that we heard uh, this uh, speaking in public comment, especially from the Hill and to some extent from Martin Akers, who you know are experiencing a lot of difficulty <laughs> because of the, the student population there. And I grew up on the Hill. I experienced some of this. I think it's probably worse now. Um, but I'm not sure that that is really a function of the occupancy per se. I feel like it's more, excuse me, more a function of just the pervasiveness of that age group and demographic throughout the area. And so I don't feel that increasing the occupancy limits there is going to significantly affect those problems. We need to deal with those problems. Um, but I don't think that occupancy is going to significantly worsen it. The last thing I'll say is, the, to me, the fundamental problem is we just don't have enough particularly student-oriented housing. And part of that is because we don't have zoning for it, right? The, the low-density zoning in on the Hill goes pretty much up to the university. In Martin Acres, it goes pretty much up to the university. Uh, the whatever the, the area just um, northeast of campuses, whatever that little residential area is, there was talk about upzoning that in the past and it didn't happen. Uh, there's an example from Eugene where they upzoned around the university. Developers built big, all much taller than would be allowed in Boulder, but but very dense student housing directly around the university. And that pulled the, the students out of the, res, the, the neighborhood areas, quote unquote, not really keen on that term, but you know what I mean? It pulled them out and significantly reduced the amount of sort of conflict between students and non-students in the rest of the city. And so uh, we have not done that. And to me, that's part of the problem. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. So Mark and then George. Um, I'm going to begin with a, a, a question I should have asked earlier. Carl, can we regulate occupancy based on different criteria for people that are members of a family under the federal definition of a family? So I, if I have a three bedroom house and I have nine kids and two adults plus grandma and auntie, we can't, my understanding is, and I, I wanna be correct in this, is that federal law prohibits us from actually limiting the occupancy of that house based on the number of people in the family. Is that correct? That's correct. There was a Supreme Court decision in the 1970s related to that. Yeah, okay. So uh, my comments are go to foundationally, what is the goal of our code? What are we trying to achieve? And I think that sometimes we start nibbling around the edges of these things and debating three versus four versus five versus number of bedrooms, when in fact, what we're what the role of government is, is to provide a property owner with the ability of, and a person with the ability of quiet enjoyment of their property, the ability to have freedom of association, which is constitutionally, uh, it's part of our constitution, freedom of movement. And so we get into trouble when I think government starts trying to define family and the, and the definition of family in very recent years has changed with the, the allowance of uh, broadening of, of who's allowed to marry. And I think, you know, for me, broadening of the definition of who, 
who is allowed to marry is a great thing. And I, I, we're seeing um, greater, we're seeing progress in that regard. And so, and then I, then I look at the code and, and I find it um, kind of strange and sad that if you read 9-8-5A, it reads as follows. Subject to the provisions of chapter 10-2, uh, quote, property maintenance code, BRC 1981. This is where it gets important here. No persons except the following persons shall occupy a dwelling unit. So we have our code beginning with, with, the, with uh, what should be a little parenthetical two, two commas there. No person shall occupy a dwelling unit. We begin in the negative. And I think that's, that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, that we criminalize the act of being, the act of seeking shelter, the act of fulfilling um, what are fundamental needs of, of shelter, of food, of um, uh, uh, association and society. So I, I think that in answering this question, uh, we need to really look at what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do, what I interpret as trying to do, is to keep person A from infringing upon the quiet enjoyment of person B and in, in, in their property, which takes me right back around to code enforcement and, and, and looking at uh, policing and criminalizing behavior versus the act of being, the act of seeking shelter. And so, you know, I, I know that this is probably beyond the scope. You know, when your counsel says, gee, should we up it from three to four or four to five? I, I, I get it that that's a, that may be a, an easier question to answer, but I think that um, as, a, as a city, if we look and say, is this really the right thing to do at all to, criminalize the act of seeking shelter, of criminalize the act of not having a blood relation, maybe we'll come up with a simpler code and we'll change our focus to behavioral uh, problems rather than familial status problems. And those problems of our own making of define, trying to define familial status. So those are, those are my comments. Thank you, Mark. Um, George, then Laura. I'll try to uh, I try to bullet my stuff out to to make somewhat brief. Um, I find it challenging to support anything related to this without more data. I mean, we are completely absent any data, and the data, as far as the comparisons of city, I think we need to get much more granular because. Um, housing a lot of this a lot of this centers around the student population and CU has woefully undersupplied their students with dorm rooms that's a fact um, many schools uh, including the school that I went to um, when I when I when I went to undergraduate there was freshman only dorms and then we were pushed out into Ithaca and um similar to very similar to Boulder, right? The, the dilapidated housing stock, students cramming in and it becoming a big problem for the neighbors in the neighborhood, as well as for the town um, and enforcement's difficult in those situations. Uh, it also was a terrible student experience at the end of the day. Uh, and so what my university did to, to rectify that was basically put together a 20 to 30 year plan to go ahead and build dorms and now every, um, every, up to every sophomore is now completely housed on campus. Um, that's a requirement. And CU has not made that commitment to Boulder. Instead, Boulder is sitting here trying to figure out what CU should have figured out a long time ago and should be figuring out and giving us a strategic plan now as a city because we are in a crisis in those neighborhoods. We heard from all those neighbors that, that live there now. Um, that, that's a major problem and that, that student, that student population is also pushing on the affordability of Boulder. There are other dynamics that are happening, but that student population is, is pushing a lot of that housing stock 
to unaffordable levels. And the students actually migrate outside of Uni Hill. Um, I'm, I'm all the way in North Boulder. We've got students um, creeping in older home stock there. And the other component that I think is lacking here is any component around, will this do anything for affordability? Because I think a lot of people, I think the majority of people really want at the core of it to try to make Boulder a more affordable, accessible place for everyone, as do I. But what I see is, is the opposite uh, happening with something like this potentially, um, where uh, uh, another sort of anecdote is I've got uh, my directly adjacent neighbors pay $3,300 a month for their single family home for their family. It's got four bedrooms in it. Um, in, in this scenario right now, they're not competing. Uh, they're not competing that aggressively against the student population. But in a scenario where occupancies are raised and all of a sudden the landlord of that house can get $1,500 a bedroom or four, four units, that goes from a $3,300 house, and their, their rent is already getting raised to about $4,000. Um, that goes from a $3,300 house to a $6,000 house. And now that family is pushed out of the neighborhood by, again, the, the same thing which I bring up at the beginning. So, you know, again, it, it's, it's the complete absence of data and just feelings that we're going off of. And if we want data, the data was there was there was a vote put towards uh, the constituents of Boulder. The vote was made, and that's what's out there. And I think we owe it to people if we're going to make changes to provide them with real data and backup that we're going to solve our problems here and not just create more, because there are far too many questions about creating problems around the definition of family. I, I, I'm you know to sort of Mark's point, right? I think I think you know, we need to consider that as, as human beings and make sure that that's set up appropriately in our code in a way that, that also honors what this is trying to do, but at the same time also honors where we're headed as a society and make sure that everyone is included. Um, but we really, really need to consider the impacts to affordability, to the neighborhoods and the students. And I, I think come up with a, a true plan that's data-driven and put it back to the voters. It may get superseded by the state either way. And then um, truthfully, I think the council's misdirected here because I think where we should be putting our pressure as a city is on CU and getting them to build more dorm rooms to solve this problem. And we're going out where we're just letting the, the tail wag the dog. Um, so that's my, that's my uh, short or tried to be short. Thank you, George, Laura, then Lisa, and then I'll call on myself. So I'm going to agree with George that ideally we could work with the university to get more dorm rooms built. I do think that's both a better community experience and a better student experience. Speaking as someone who spent all four years of my undergraduate in university housing and enjoyed the experience greatly. Um, and, and I came from the collegiest college town uh, in America, the highest uh, amount of students per townies. And the only reason why we didn't have a higher percentage of rentals rented to students than here in Boulder is because there were so few rentals because everybody lived on campus. Um, I, I do think that that is an ideal model and hopefully we can as a city work with CU to get more dorms built. But that's a different question than what we're talking about tonight. Um, so my, my comments on this project, you know, my understanding of the benefits of increasing occupancy are twofold. One is the problem that Kurt mentioned about people who are currently living over occupied, giving them stability, letting them come into the light of legal status, which also gives them the ability to pursue their legal rights as renters if the landlord is not keeping up the property and is not doing right by them. Um, you know, when you're living over occupied, you don't complain about things like uh, drafty windows or the washing machine not working or, or whatever that thing is that the landlord is not doing to maintain their property. Um, so I think that's one benefit. The other big benefit is that it is the gentlest form of infill that I can think of is to have um, 
more efficient usage of the structures that are already built in these neighborhoods. The pressure from investors is real. It's happening now, you know, as many of our commenters mentioned, there's already this turnover of housing to investors and they're either going to rent it out and make a profit that way, or they're going to tear it down and build a very large luxury home, the largest thing that they can build. And it might still stay in a single family occupancy, but it, it will change the character of the neighborhood when the neighborhood is no longer middle class working people and families and is large luxury homes. Um, so I, I don't object to giving uh, a different way to make a profit other than tear your house down and build it as big as you possibly can. So I do think that that uh, increasing occupancy is gentle infill. I do support the direction that council is going to think about changing it to four or five citywide. I'm glad that they are trying to get more sources of input and more perspectives on this question. Um, you know, I, I do think that uh, supply and demand have an impact. Obviously, you do not charge the same thing for a bedroom in a house shared with six people as you do for a bedroom in a house shared with three people. Um, people who are tenants, they do look at what the options are and they understand what they're getting for their money and the more options that they have, the less likely they are to choose to live in a very crowded situation. Um, or in a more crowded situation, some will choose to, to live less um, crowded. So uh, you can shop around basically is the point. When you have more options, you can shop around and that does lower rental prices. Maybe not to the extent that everybody would like, but I don't think it's a strict, I'm gonna charge X amount per bedroom no matter whether I can have three people there or five people there. So um, I'm, I'm glad to see this project moving forward. Um, I do think that it is respectful of the input that was received from, from voters who did not like the bedrooms are for people solution of one person per bedroom. This is a different way of, of looking at it that I do think will help us to make better use of the existing property that we have, but will not encounter that problem that, that was so prevalent in the conversation around bedrooms are for people of, well, we'll just turn our dining room into a bedroom and we'll put three bedrooms in the basement and we'll just add as many bedrooms as we possibly can and get 10 or 12 or 15 people in a property. I don't, I don't think that this uh, encounters that same problem. So um, those are my comments. Thank you, Laura, uh, Lisa, and then I'll call on myself. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's interesting, as, as I often am, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, I completely agree that CU has externalized their housing problem onto the rest of the city and has done that for a very, very long time. I've had some, in my opinion, amusing conversations with people from CU where they're like, what is Boulder doing to solve the housing crisis? And I'm like, why didn't you buy up a bunch of houses like a whole bunch of other <laughs> universities did back in the 60s and 70s and like deal with the problem? Anyway. Um, you know, so so that that's something that we deal with, and I I very much would push back to council. You know, whether it's this or anything else, whatever gets passed doesn't get passed. Whatever the state does to continue to the extent that we can to put pressure on CU because you know it's on them to also provide housing. Um, I do agree that you know looking at doing four or five people, whether it's across the whole city or in certain areas, is much better than just the strict bedrooms for people because I think that did create an incentive to start subdividing absolutely everything into a bedroom. <laughs> um, and, and I will just push back from a landlord's perspective. I mean, if, if you've got a property that you can legally rent out to like four or five college students who are gonna pay you a thousand to 1200 or 1500 a month, I would, we would do that. Like my dad has a couple of properties there in Louisville, not Boulder. He's owned properties in Boulder before. We would have a really hard time saying no to that. Um, you know, we, we would even though they can be very hard on houses, you know, um, because how do you walk away from that versus like, I know multiple overoccupied houses near me, not hard to hide. Um, you know, people are like the roommate who doesn't exist on the lease showed up to the landlord meeting and we just had to pretend she was a friend, you know? And I was like, that's awkward. And they're like, we put the mattress up and I'm like, yeah, we know the tricks, right. You know what to do, but you take that, that chunk of change and you divide it across five instead of four and it is more affordable as opposed to legally renting to five where you set the per room rent. You know, I, I that will happen at least close to the university. So um, whereas in some of the other outlying areas, I'm not so concerned about it. I guess what I would sort of recommend up to counselor, my feedback would be maybe go for four instead of five to start if you're going to do this. If it goes well at four or it's not, and, and maybe also allocate some funds and some time and effort toward enforcement of any externalities that come up, 
recognize that this is not, this is mostly just going to mean more legal student housing. Like that's, that's basically what you're enabling. Um, I, I'm now well, 40, um, but like, you know, all my friends in their thirties and forties started buying, right. And most of them bought in Erie, Louisville and Lafayette. This is really primarily an issue for people in college and in their twenties before they realize they either can't afford to be in Boulder or decide to buy something small. Um, it's going to be student housing. I, I just, I don't see how it's not. Um, you know, the one, the one caveat that I would put on top of that, that was something that I thought was a really good point back with bedrooms are for people with some of the other stuff is senior housing, you know, legalizing it, you know, across the board also legalizes it for seniors who are going to be in trouble soon if they're not already, um, and maybe looking for more affordable housing. So I, I don't know if that's a strong enough take. I, I don't think it's going to solve all our problems. I think you're going to see a lot of 5,000 plus rents, you know, going to students. I, is that the goal? I don't know. It's nice for landlords, I guess. Um, you know, and, but again, like, is it going to do anything that terrible to move it up to four or maybe five? Maybe not. I mean, a lot of those are over-occupied already. It just legally allows you to raise rent higher. So, um, yeah. And I'm curious to see what the state does. That'll be interesting. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Um, my take. Um, so I'm going to touch on some things that other of my colleagues have said. Uh, so first, if the goal is to increase opportunities while maintaining neighborhood character, I think we, which is a quote from the docket, I think what we heard from the CU adjacent neighbors is that occupancy increases in those neighborhoods will not enable maintaining what's left of those neighborhood characters, character. So that's a concern. And there's this whole matter of, I don't know, democracy. <laughs> we, you know, there was an outcome of a public ballot measure. And I think it's a big mistake to override uh, the public's vote. Um, uh, I, I think that's just a mistake to disregard voters. Um, if we were to move forward with this, I would say, I think I'd agree with Lisa, no more than four, and then with overlays um, for near in, near CU communities or neighborhoods. I realize that we normally do this via zones, not via neighborhoods. So you'd have to come up with some sort of mechanism for that. But I was, I have to say, I, I almost cried when Lisa Nelson was talking about how, you know, her emotional response to how her neighborhood has changed after living there for 30 years. That's, that, that was moving. Um, uh, uh, so forth, uh, Boulder is now majority renter. And um, I think we need to be cognizant of what occupancy increases will do to further erosion of home ownership in town. And I think that that is something we we want to, not that renters are bad, but there are positive impacts of home ownership, both for individuals and families, but also for sense of community and engagement and belonging and a sense of place and all of those things. Um, I'm specifically concerned. Um, so if you actually look at our occupancy regulations, you can't have more than two people in an ELU. Um, and I believe that we need to maintain that. But the broad brush four or five does not take into account the size of a unit. I, I, don't, I don't know whether um, single one bedrooms are a maximum of three unrelated. Uh, or whether they too have a limit of two unrelated, but I think for ELUs and one bedrooms, four or five would not be a good idea. So we'd want to break it out by the size of dwelling units, or not the size, the the number in this case, the smaller dwelling units. Um, I totally agree with George. There is no mechanism here to guarantee affordability, um, and if the whole point here is affordability why isn't there a mechanism to guarantee affordability? Um, I think Lisa has made the point really well. Most, not all, but most landlords will be like, great, I can charge more and make more because that's the point of my being a landlord <laughs> is to make some profit on my this, this asset that I own. And I think if we do not have a mechanism to guarantee affordability, this, you, you, this, is, a, this is a failed, it would be a failed ordinance. Um, I also think, and I don't know how you would do this, but I'm quite concerned about families who rent, who are going to find themselves in competition with five, four or five individuals who can each pay a, a sum of money. Those families are 
are going to find themselves to George's uh, next door neighbor, they're going to find themselves in competition with a larger number of people who can each pay a significant amount of money. And that's going to further push out families, particularly families with children. And I think that is something we do not want to have happen in Boulder. Um, I don't know how you, I don't know how you address that except by not raising the occupancy or coming up with a mechanism for affordability or some sort of mechanism that protects families who rent. I don't know what that mechanism would be, but this concerns me greatly. Um, I've already talked about exempting neighborhoods surrounding CU. Um, I agree with uh, everyone who's talked about expanding enforcement tools for over occupancy, or in this case, if you raised it to four, meeting the occupancy or not, bypassing, not going over the occupancy limits. Um, and I, I realize that there are challenges to that, but if it's a law on the books, it's a law on the books and a city has the right to enforce that law how, uh, you know, in ways that don't violate someone's human rights. Um, I, I agree with everyone who has said we need to put pressure on CU uh, to use more, to um, build more housing and to uh, Kurt's point that you know we we could have zone blah, blah CU owns a ton of land CU CU has parking lots galore in Willville that could be transformed into 10 story high rises like the other 10 story high rises that are there that would produce more housing they have area they have land over by um college avenue they could build on they didn't have to build 700 they didn't have to get 750 square 750,000 square feet of office space approved at CU South that could have all been student housing. But to George's point, they have not made housing students a priority at all. And the consequence has been a spillover onto the city. The city keeps solving, trying to solve CU's problems without being able to solve its own problems of not having enough affordable housing that is affordable for people who work here and families. I think you have to deal with parking. Um, which is an issue I'm going to bring up as well in the next uh, topic. Um, so transfer of parking responsibility from a, from a landlord or a developer to the city means that ultimately the city is going to have to create a, a citywide way to value parking and will have to create a citywide uh, charging station infrastructure as more and more people go to EVs. And this is going to end up being a taxpayer cost. So I think we just need to really be thinking about those long-term infrastructure costs, which ML also brought up. She, she may not have been thinking about EV, but those infrastructure costs are very real. And the city has to, the city has to know what that's going to cost us to keep up. Okay. So I already talked about policies that actually, oh, I would, uh, I would suggest that what the city would be better focused on if they really want to address affordability is to increase the percentage of permanently affordable units in new developments and increase commercial linkage fees to support development of permanently affordable units. I think, you know, increasing the increasing the number of ADUs and increasing by one the number of people who can live in a house not only have follow-on effects but are really at the edges of the fix the at the edges of fixing the problem. And then in, in terms of public engagement, I am um, honestly, I, should, I don't know how, I don't know exactly what the obstacles are, but I feel like since COVID started, the city really withdrew from public engagement processes and has not figured out with the end of COVID how to, how to fully come back to what they used to do. Um, and how to fully utilize the 2018 public participation processes. I, I know I, I see the um, graphs and I know what you all are trying to do, but I think there's a disconnect between the, what you put out there as, you know, please participate and actual participation. And I, I do not know how to, how you fix that problem, but I don't think Be Heard Boulder is the solution. It is part of the solution, but it is an inadequate tool for gathering, you know, a wide range of viewpoints. So those are all of my thoughts. Um, does anyone have additional things they want to bring up or shall we move on to, or does Carl have any 
thing he wants to ask us or shall we move on to the next thing? Laura put her hand up, Laura. Just one thing that I want to mention, you know, I agree that the enforcement is a challenge and I uh, that the city needs more staff and more resources towards enforcement of those um, uh, impacts to neighborhoods like noise and traffic and trash uh, parking. Um, but I wanted to talk about the other side of the coin, which is um, incentives to encourage better relationships in some of these neighborhoods. And I know that the city has programs, for example, to do neighborhood block parties and funding for that. Or um, I, I believe there's some programs for student volunteerism in their own neighborhoods. And so I think we should also look at better developing those ways to connect students and residents so that there isn't this adversarial dynamic in the neighborhoods that people are talking to each other about things other than when they have a problem with each other um, and think about those incentives to encourage better neighborhood relationships so i just wanted to put that out there also as something to think about um, in conjunction with this project great laura thank you um Carl, did you get from us what you need on this topic? More than what you need? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I got what I need. I don't, I don't have any questions. Okay, great. So let's move on to um, mm. affordable house, housing, zoning for affordable housing. Okay, so we'll switch gears. Next slide, please. Next slide, okay. All right, one thing we wanted to start off with was what do we mean when we say affordable housing as part of this part of the presentation? So we wanted to break it down into three categories. So obviously, most of the time when we say affordable housing, we're talking about deed restricted, permanently affordable housing. So that's certainly part of this collection. But what we're, what we're also talking about um, is affordable, attainable housing or what people have called workforce housing or just trying to get um, in the third category, more modest sized market rate housing, because um, it's all connected. And, and that's the point that we're gonna try to make through this presentation is just where are there opportunities in the city to allow more housing so that we can get more deed restricted housing. So I'll, I'll paint that picture a little bit more as we move forward. Uh, so next slide, please. So the point we're trying to make here is that there are some density limitations in certain zoning districts where particularly where housing is anticipated or planned for in the Boulder Valley Comforts of Plan, um, where the, the, the way that the density is set up, it, it actually drives more large units or, or just large sized units, which is not what we're typically trying to get, we're trying to get a, a diversity of, of units, unit sizes. So by relaxing some density limitations in these areas, you can increase the number of housing units in those areas um, within the same size of buildings, just so you can get more units. And by getting more units, it would you would get more on-site affordable units because the city code already requires 25% of whatever the number of units are have to be deed restricted, permanently affordable, or alternatively, you would get more cash in lieu fund going in. And the thing to point out is that with cash in lieu, it does enable uh, developers and um, quasi housing agencies to leverage that money to actually get more affordable housing units that you may even get uh, on site by using that money to get other funds from, from like the federal government. Um, so that's the point we're trying to make through this presentation that uh, relaxing some density allowances will actually increase the amount of housing and as a result, uh, deed restricted housing. Uh, so next slide, please. Carl, I'm sorry, yeah. Carl, can you just go back through, just to clarify the way mm -hmm. the, 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 the argument, which is, the 25% of units have to be deed restricted or the same number of units have to be built. How does the cash in lieu reflect the number of units? Because you're talking about smaller units, therefore more deed restricted or more cash in lieu, but I, it was a little unclear. Yeah, I mean, so basically any development that comes in 25% of the number of residential units either has to be on site permanently afford affordable deed restricted or they would have to pay 
an, a cash in lieu fee per unit of that amount that goes into the affordable housing fund. Does that make sense? And is, and is the number, is it per unit, just unit, or is it per unit square foot? It would be an, an amount per unit. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. I just, it was, I was a little confused. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to start at the um, policy level um, to talk about this particular discussion since the way this project started at the council level in 2022 is really focused on relaxing certain zoning districts to get more housing types. Uh, but that's kind of grown over the last few months, similar to like what we're seeing in the state legislation that there's interest in potentially looking at allowing uh, more housing types in uh, traditionally single family areas of the city. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the construct of how the city regulates density, just so we have a clear understanding moving forward. So obviously everything we do through our zoning ordinance is implementing what the vision in the Boulder Valley Comforts of Plan is. So this slide is meant to just show kind of the, the framework for the whole city, the vision, is set out in all the comp plan policies, all the focus areas. And then it's implemented in a number of different ways. Like it can be through, you know, uh, commercial or um, the capital improvement projects, certain programs, strategic plans. In this case with zoning, it would be through the land use code. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about. So next slide. So when you look at the, the Boulder Valley Comforts of Plan, uh, in the beginning pages of it, there's a number of focus areas uh, that go on over a number of different topics. Obviously, housing affordability and diversity is considered one of the primary focus areas uh, in the comp plan. So we, we've taken this very seriously um, uh, in this particular project. Next slide, please. And you can see that there's a number of uh, comp plan policies that apply to housing affordability, um, addressing the jobs housing imbalance, looking at a number of different ways of getting more affordable housing, um, protection of, of and support for residential neighborhoods, uh, a number of different ways of, of really trying to address um, the housing crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So starting at the holistic level, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the BVCP. So everything that we do through zoning has to be consistent with our land use designation. So you can see that all the, the land uses throughout the city have a land use designation. And it's basically the vision for those areas. And then that ultimately gets implemented through the actual zoning districts. So you can see that um, a, a wide range of the area is considered very low density residential or low density residential shown in like the beige and the yellow. And then you can see that the um, when you get more towards the brown is high density residential and then a number of different land uses. But I just wanted to start with the land use map that we are always you know, looking at to make sure that it's consistent or zoning is consistent with it. Uh, next slide, please. So when you go into the land use designations of the, the Comp plan. It has basically the vision statements or the characteristics of all the different land uses. So you can see um, there. What I'm trying to lay out here is that the request to increase density in a lot of the areas that are single family uh, is a much more involved process. It's not something that can easily be changed. And I'm saying this absent, you know, what might happen at the state level, because like if the state passes a mandate that overrides you know, local governing authority, we may have to come through with an ordinance and make a lot of changes to the comp plan um, hand in hand uh, to, to meet the state code. But that aside, um, we do have, you know, we do look at the comp plan like it is the, the a legal document that we have to follow. So you can see that these lower density zones do have uh, intensity limitations. So very low density areas are two dwelling units per acre or less. That tends to be uh, one of the lowest density areas of the city, typically areas that were developed in the county that were annexed into the city um, have that density. 
A lot of the single family zones throughout the city are the yellow. So that's uh, low density residential. That allows two to six dwelling units per acre. Um, so that's our RL1 and our RL2 zones. Um, and then you get into medium density, which is the orange, which is six to 14 dwelling units per acre. So you can see that there's not a lot of flexibility in the comp plan uh, related to this piece. Uh, next slide, please. When we get into higher density, we have a little bit more um, flexibility because it allows more dwelling units per acre, particularly in the high density residential areas. It just says more than 14 dwelling units per acre. So we are able to make changes to high density residential zones uh, that aren't necessarily like including a density cap like you see in some of the single family uh, neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Oh, Carl, just I see that Kurt has his hand up. I don't know if he has a question specifically for you right now. I do. Do you want to take it now or do you want to take it at the end of this presentation? Um, I'm pretty close to the slide that has the question. So maybe that might, maybe I'll okay. hopefully answer it in this question or in this slide. But if not, I'm happy to do it. Um, I think it's it could be the next slide. Oh, wait. Okay, thanks. Okay. So as far as like how, how does Boulder regulate density, you can see there's the different categories, um, the less than two dwelling units per acre, the two to six for low density, six to 14 for medium, and then more than 14 for high density. So the way that translates into our zoning code or our land use code is in a lot of cases, it's, it's a minimum lot size per dwelling unit. So um, for instance, the, the rural residential RR or residential estate or low density residential zones, RL1, uh, only permit one detached unit per lot. So on an RR lot, you have to have one uh, unit per every 30,000 square feet, which is the, the minimum lot size. Uh, one unit per every 15,000 square feet, minimum lot size in RE. It's 7,000 in RL1, which is our most common uh, single family zoning district. Then it gets a little bit more complicated with RL2. It's it's not a minimum, it's not a minimum of land area or lot area per dwelling unit. It's a minimum amount of, of uh, open space per dwelling unit. So it's 6,000 square feet of open space per unit. Uh, and then you have the RMX1 zone, which is 6,000 uh, square feet of, of min, uh, min per, per unit. Uh, next, next slide, please. Well, maybe it's 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 like it might be right after this one, but. What we're basically saying is that um, there's no density caps in certain land uses in the comp plan. So there is more flexibility in the high density residential land uses, mixed use land, uh, land uses, um, business land uses, and the industrial land uses. Um, and if you look at the intensity standards in the land use code, there are some zoning districts that have no density limit. So it's not unprecedented. So we do have some flexibility to make changes to certain zones to get more housing. And I'll be showing an argument of why um, that makes sense to get more affordable housing. So when we look at the growth areas in the city, which is typically you know, uh, neighborhood centers and areas where the comp plan anticipates more mixed use and housing, you can see the map from the comp plan that shows the different neighborhood centers. Those areas are largely zoned either BR, which is regional business, that's like around 28th Street, uh, community business, which is like the neighborhood centers like Basemar or, or Meadows or Diagonal Plaza, uh, RH areas along corridors. And then also we, we made changes recently to the use standards to allow more land areas within the industrial zones that can allow uh, residential. So we're we're really trying to move on what the comp plan in the last update said, which is really try to make it easier for housing in like light industrial areas or in commercial areas. So that's largely been our focus in this project. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking about some changes to those areas. But one thing we did talk about with council is looking at the low density areas. There are opportunities to change the code to allow duplexes and triplexes in instances where it wouldn't require changing the BVCP. So we, we would like to get some feedback from the board on this. This is really in areas where there might be a lot that's large enough that it could be subdivided into two single family houses. So what we're saying is that we could change the code where an alternative could be that they don't subdivide 
they just put a duplex or they convert an existing single family house to a duplex because they have the land area. It wouldn't be inconsistent with the comp plan. So we do wanna get your feedback on that. Uh, so next slide, please. Sorry, still one more slide. So I, I wanted to make a, a clarification about uh, what the difference between density and intensity is. Um, we have what we call intensity standards, which really regulate how much can happen on a property. Um, and density is part of that. So we use a number of different tools in different zoning districts to regulate what can happen on a property in terms of its, its mass and bulk or the level of activity that happens on the property. So just to be clear, density is really the number of dwelling units that are permitted on the property. And that has to be consistent with the comp plan in the zoning district. So that's you know either the, the calculation of uh, um, how many units per, per lot amount of lot area or how many units per amount of open space. Intensity is, is a slightly different way of going about it. That's where we look at floor area, like a floor area ratio. So that's where you add up all the square footage on all the floors of a building and you divide by the lot area. And you can see from this graphic that FAR is an important tool and it can work, but it really depends on what other requirements you're also applying. You know, so obviously we don't get eight story buildings in Boulder anymore, but you can see that like on the bottom line, you get a four story building. That's a 2.0 FAR, which is kind of analogous to what you see downtown and around uh, Boulder Junction, things like that. So because of our height limit and the requirements we have on open space, parking, uh, setbacks, you know, things like that, they all those things come together to determine how much can be built on the property. But density is really just a factor of how many units. So once you get that FAR and you figure out the box, it's how that gets split up into units. So that's where it gives us some opportunity for trying to get more housing without having it visually be a much uh, larger project. Uh, next slide, please. So Kurt, am I answering any of your questions or, or, or do you wanna jump in now? Uh, you're not, but keep going. I can ask later, that's fine. Okay. So what, what this is leading up to is this table, and I know this is kind of overwhelming to, to look at, but I think if I walk you through it, you'll, you'll understand where we're coming from. So we wanted to use Diagonal Plaza as an example of why this, these types of changes would get more housing and more uh, deed-restricted permanently affordable housing. So the first line is the actual zoning that's applied to Diagonal Plaza. So it's BC1. And the density limit there is you have to have 1,200 square feet of open space per unit. So when you apply that to that site, it gets you a, a total density of around 22 dwelling units per acre. It really depends on how they design it. But it, it's generally a more, uh, I would say, a more suburban uh, amount of open space that's required for that area. So you'd be able to get about 120 dwelling units on the site. So when we apply the, the required 25% for inclusionary housing that has to be deed restricted, you would get 30 IH units out of a project there. And that particular zone, when you look at the fourth column, there's no FAR limit in that zone. Again, all zones are very different. Some have dwelling units per acre, some have FAR, some have both. One, one zone we've heard a lot about as having a, a construct that basically drives large units is BR1, which is again in that commercial area around 29th Street in the village. It has a 1600 square foot of lot area per dwelling unit requirement, which is pretty common in a lot of the um, high density zones. So when you apply that to a site, you can get to a max of about 27 dwelling units per acre. So if we applied that zoning to say the, the Diagonal Plaza project, you get about 148 units. So 25% of that would be 37 units that would be deed restricted. So you get a little bit more with like BR1 zoning. In this case, BR1 zoning has a 2.0 FAR requirement. So one thing that's interesting is if you do, you find out what the floor area is in BR1, and then you divide it by the number of units that you can get with that 1600 square feet of lot area per unit, it 
you get an average of well over 3,000 square feet per unit. So you can see where the zoning sets up large units, which is not what really the goals of the plan are. Um, so the, the third line shows what the applicant had requested through the Diagonal Plaza project, and you can see how it's very different than the underlying zoning. So with the special ordinance that was applied, they actually applied a 15% open space requirement as part of that project. And they ended up getting a density of 50 dwelling units per acre at Diagonal Plaza. So this was something that was approved by special ordinance. The number of units is 282 units. So when you apply the 25% IH requirement to that, then you have 70 IH deed restricted units. So you can see that just Allowing that flexibility enabled more than a doubling of the amount of IH units, and you would have more smaller units. Because if you apply, say, the 2.0 to in this scenario, you would get a much lower average uh, unit size, you know, roughly like 1,200 square feet per unit. So I think that's the goal that we're really trying to work towards. So what we've been asked by council to do is look at these particular areas like we're in trying to address the diagonal plaza project and the example change is basically getting rid of the 1200 square feet of open space per unit or the 1600 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit and then just putting an far cap and then letting the site review process the height limits the setbacks the the uh, landscaping and open space requirements that ordinary apply based on building height and the FAR be the drivers of regulating the, the intensity on the site and not have these calculators that get don't get you as many housing units. So I just wanted to kind of paint that picture. So I think the next slide is the questions. So does planning board have any questions of how the city regulates residential density and then any questions related to the overall project? Uh, Kurt and then ML. Yeah, uh, thanks. That was great presentation. So I'm still confused about the comp plan density limits. It seems like you are applying them on a per parcel basis. Is that right? Generally through zoning, yes, it's through a par per parcel basis. Well, I realize through zoning, but we... It seems like part of the, the, the rationale is not about the zoning per se, but about those comp plan uh, land use designation density limits. And the reason that I'm asking, so it sounds like we're still sort of thinking about those as being applied on a per parcel basis, but if you look just above in the comp plan, if you look just above where it talks about the different land uses, it says uh, residential densities range from very low to high density. It is assumed that variations of the densities on a small area basis within any particular designation may occur, but an average density will be maintained for the designation. So, for example, when LR talks about two to six dwelling units per acre, my understanding of this wording is it doesn't mean that every parcel needs to meet that. It's that if you average the density over all of the LR land use designation, it needs to be between two and six dwelling units per acre. So, so I'm just, I'm trying to understand, I mean, I don't know what the, these average densities are, you know, for LR and for MR and for HR, but it seems like those are what we need to be paying attention to based on what the comp plan says, rather than, the, the per parcel densities. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand this distinction. Yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from. And I think, you know, we can look into that further. It's just, you know, there, there's a certain level of 
complexity when you're dealing with an average over a large area. Um, and, you know, generally the designation sets the density and then we write the zoning to kind of fulfill that. And, you know, we might be able to look at full blocks and see what the averages are, but it's just, it's very, it gets very complicated at that point to see, you know, if there's flexibility to allow increased density or not. It seems like it's it's more straightforward to apply it through a zoning district. So I think the point that I, I'm trying to make in the presentation is that absent the, the state legislation, if we're looking at some wholesale changes to these areas, particularly the single family areas, we we I think we do have to go back and consider these types of changes through an, a, a comp planning update process to really have that holistic analysis done to see how that should speak to changes that we make in the zoning. Um, and, and it's just, it, it's a much more involved process than just going into the zoning code and changing, you know, the minimum lot sizes or, or dwelling units per acre calculations um, without a more involved analysis and outreach process. So, um, ML, can, I, can I, sorry, can I'm I follow sorry, up? Go ahead, yeah. I, I guess I'm still, it, it, I'm, I'm still not really understanding because to me, I read this statement in the comp plan and it's pretty unambiguous that it's not about the per parcel density. And yet that still seems to be what we are coming back to even in the the case of um, well, even when we're talking about the 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 comp plan designations, I guess maybe let me ask about it this way. So R H, sorry, the H R land use designation says more than fourteen dwelling units per acre, right? Right. And yet our zoning allows for single family in RH2, for example, right? It does. There, there's a use review requirement now if you establish a new single family home. So I guess, it seems to me, and I'm maybe, yeah, maybe this is turning into a comment, but I'm I'm still I'm still a little bit lost as to why we're not using uh, the 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 fairly clear language at the beginning of these the land use designations about how this in density is intended to be interpreted. Um, hey, Kurt, do you have a page like, number? Uh, yeah, so I'm looking at page 110 of 174 in the uh, okay. uh, plan. It's it's right above these little colored sections that that Carl showed um, a, a few slides back. Okay, uh, it, it, the the light blue entitled residential categories. Right. And so the second paragraph, as I read before, says residential densities range from very low to high density. And then the key sentence is the next one. It is assumed that variations of the densities on a small area basis within any particular designation may occur, but an average density will be maintained for the designation. So it, it I think, seems like- I see, I see what you're saying, Kurt. I, I just- I think the point we're trying to make is that, you know, when this project was, you know, conceived by, by council as something that we should work on, it was really to look at things that could be quickly done to remove zoning barriers to additional housing. And I think the analysis of trying to look at single family neighborhoods and trying to figure out counting up all the units within a land area and then figuring out how to dole out whatever might be um, allowable based on an overall average is, is highly complex. 
Um, I think it's something that we could do. I just, I think, you know, with, within the scope of this project, I think that's why we've been focusing, you know, on the areas where there isn't a, a cap um, and focusing, air, you know, housing in those particular areas. And yeah, and recognizing that there are some lots that have subdivision potential that could be changed to duplexes or triplexes and that could be implemented. But I, I think looking at the averaging piece, I think is, uh, I don't know, I just, I think it adds another layer onto this that uh, could be quite challenging. Yeah, maybe I can chime in and just add to what Carl's saying. So. I, we, we've heard a version of this question in a couple different contexts, and I think it's safe to say that we recognize and will flag this as part of the comprehensive plan update. But just to elaborate on what Carl's saying is, if we approach that kind of concept in the comp plan as administrative directive, it, it, it's impossible to administer. I, I would go farther than what Carl said, actually than difficult, it's, it's, it's impossible because it requires an accounting of every single lot in those areas or in the city, and it creates winners and losers by de facto. So when that area designated in the comp plan hits a threshold, suddenly everybody else isn't eligible. And, and that's really not, not kind of the in, intent in talking about the character of those areas uh, as defined in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. And, and more substantively, it gets to the point of adequate services to those areas too. And that also is something that we've recognized both through this conversation or, or conversations around this topic and others needs to be a focus of the comp plan update as well. Um, there needs to be adequate carrying capacity uh, when you start to, start to envision um, you know the intensification based on on some of that logic. So I, I would I would just say it's it's a it, we we understand the the point. Um, one, there are no easy answers, and two, it is beyond the scope of what council asked us to do in, in trying to be expeditious with some known potential zoning changes. If that if that's helpful, Kurt. Does does that meet your needs for now, Kurt? I'm driving at Sarah's request for a moment. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the, thank you. Okay, good question. As, as I said, it comes up before. Um, so Sarah told me that it was ML then Marks, unless you guys want to dispute that. ML, I think you're up. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so let me see, Carl, I have a couple of questions on these questions or a couple of, yeah, questions. Um, Actually, it's more, more to number two here. So I understand that um, the low hanging fruit, which is don't look at changing Boulder Valley comp plan. Um, if that was the case, how many parcels have you, you know, um, do you think might be available for uh, upzoning? Um, in the largest housing zones, which is R, L, and I don't, there's the other one, R, R, I don't remember. How many of those parcels have the capacity to put two or more units without changing Boulder Valley comp plan limits? I mean, are we talking 10 parcels or are we talking 100 parcels? I kind of yeah. think it's not many. Yeah, so we did this analysis as part of the large homes and lots project several years ago. So we looked at um, large lots in particular. Mm -hmm. So that those are in the RE and RR zones. So those are the lots that are like 15,000 square feet minimum lot size or 30,000 square feet minimum lot size. So as part of that project, there were, um, if you looked at the overall size of, of, of the lots, there were, I think it was just over about a hundred lots that could potentially subdivide and add another single family unit. Or if we change the zoning, they could they could do a duplex or a triplex. Mm -hmm. um, so just over a hundred, I would say. However, um, we did also look at the RL zones, um, which was not part of the scope of that project. But I think because there's a, a fairly large number of, of lots that 
have not been subdivided in the RL zones that are, for instance, the minimum lot size is 7,000 square feet. Right. The number of lots that are more than 14,000 square feet that could potentially subdivide and add a unit was a much larger number. I, I believe it was like over 800 units. Oh. So we that's something we are looking at and we would want to get your feedback on. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of these pro properties, either they elect to not subdivide them because they want to have that land area, or it might be because of slope where it makes it difficult to get a building site. But those are the types of lots where you, if they have the amount of land area, they could convert their house into a duplex um, or potentially a, you know, a triplex if they have the land area. Uh, mm -hmm. And it wouldn't require a subdivision if we were to make changes along those lines. And it would still be consistent with the, the Boulder Valley Commons. Right. Yeah. So we could have um, like maybe 900 additional or lots that could be, um, could make use of a zoning change that would allow duplex, triplex, for, depending on, on land size. That's, that's, a, that's a significant number. I was thinking it was much, much less um, because obviously the, the next tier, which has already been spoken to, is um, it's a Boulder Valley comp, comp plan that is significantly limiting what we can do with the largest residential zoning in the city. Right, that is what is limiting it based on the density and intensity. Um, but 900 units, I, I I like that. And is this is this something that you are um, that is part of this task? Will you yeah, be looking we, at at allowing at making that a use by right? Yeah, I mean, we, we when we went to council, we we mostly were focused on the R, R, and R, E zones. Um, we didn't really talk about the RL zones. So it's something that we looked at after council because they, we basically recommended to not make any change to these particular areas when we went to council. And I'll talk about this on upcoming slides. There was some, you know, pushback from the council that, you know, we should consider looking at some other zones or other opportunities to, mm -hmm. to add units. So we did that. And we, we looked at the R, zones and we saw that there is um, some level of capacity there. So we do like that's why I'm saying it'd be great to get the board's feedback on that tonight so that we can convey that to council in June. Right. And making it really clear to the community that we're not talking about adding more units than, that could be more than than today. It's just these are on lots that haven't subdivided. And they're still subject to the intensity standards. I mean, I think that is something that needs to be said again and again and again, because people worry that, I mean, the big houses, I think, take the intensity standards to their maximum. Um, whereas uh, uh, looking at having more and maybe more modest size units um, may push the intensity standard as well, or may not because they're necessarily smaller units if we're talking, you know, ADUs or however one gets more housing on, on a property. So um, thank you for that. I, I like that you found um, 800 um, properties in the RL zones that have that potential. That's a big number. All right, Mark. Yeah, Carl, uh, thank you for showing that slide again. I think this might be the third or fourth time I've seen this at HAB and other meetings. And, and, uh, and I, I, uh, my, my grasp of it gets a little bit better every time, but it's, it's still, I, I still need help at times. So, when, when I, so I'm going to phrase this as a question. Um, council has come to, P and DS and said, hey, gee, we want to tweak zoning so that it's easier to have more middle housing, well, missing middle, middle income, middle housing. Okay. And so um, uh, are we, 
uh, are we nibbling around the edges in, in such a way that ultimately in a year or two from now, no one's gonna be super happy because it hasn't resulted in as great a change as what they might have envisioned. Um, so for, that's the first question. Is, is that? Are, are, I don't think with any of these changes, we can expect that when the code change happens, that all these things are going to happen instantaneous and that we're going to get a fulfillment of the goal, like in a couple of years. I mean, I think this is very long term. Right. You know, the, there's a lot of lots out there now that could have subdivided in some way and they haven't by their choice or there might be some limitations. But over time, I think you probably will see some of these things happen. I, I think that when I look at the single family neighborhoods, I think it'll be a very incremental change if this code change were to happen. Um, I think the removing some of the density limitations in the BR and BC and the I zones, I think could, um, because developers can get more units that way within potentially the same floor area, that might be the biggest um, change that we see that it would spur more development, particularly in the eastern parts of the city uh, where development is anticipated, where we're trying to get more housing in the industrial zones and along multimodal corridors and mixed use areas. I think that's where a lot of the change I think will will happen. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so the example of Diagonal Plaza and the and the diagrams you had up on the prior screen, it's so interesting to see how twisting the dial of density and intensity in different ways drives this the the number of units and their size. And so my question is is, could we take our code, and this is probably a bigger project than what anyone has envisioned, but take our code and our zones and establish an intensity and a density, um, min and maxes for each of those, and just let the chips fall where they may within those constraints? Or is that already there? It's just complex and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it. I mean, I think a lot of I, I think a lot of it's already in there. Every zoning district's a little bit different, you know, whether it has an FAR limit or a dwelling units per acre mechanism. Uh, I think it's all in there. Minimums are are a little tricky because then it it's like if somebody comes in to do like a little, you know, modification to their site, do you force them to add units when it's not it doesn't financially pan out? That you know, so minimums are very difficult. I think we just have to write it in a way that it incentivizes them to take advantage and do it. Right. So when when you guys did the ADU project, and I think, you know, it's such a great example of how simplification uh, can help, you know, no matter which side of the ADU thing you're on, it seems like simplification is a is a good thing to uh, to strive for so that everyone has clarity and people aren't coming into the planning department pulling their hair out and saying I, I don't get it so um is is this does this project allow for kind of more wholesale simplification you know Minneapolis says hey we're eliminating single family zoning and you know, that's a big kind of big wholesale thing that's easy to understand. And I'm not necessarily advocating for that, but what I am wondering about is, does this project allow for greater simplification that will also ease the, um, uh, ease the burden of decision makers, whether it's a homeowner uh, wanting to subdivide on a big lot or someone living in a particular zone, does the simplification enter into this project? 
I, I think it does. I, I think we, we've been hearing time and again about particularly the BR1 zoning district and that 1,600 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit. That It's not just in BR1, it's in RH5, it's in, an, it's in the IG and the IM zones. We keep hearing that that doesn't incentivize housing um, because the, it doesn't necessarily get the product that they want to build. Like if they want to build smaller, more modest sized units, like th that doesn't always work, you know, for them. So removing that calculation um, and, or, or the 1200 square feet of open space per dwelling unit, it's just one less thing that has to be calculated, you know, that you're using other tools that are already in the box to, to make sure that the project is compatible um, in terms of its height and bulk and massing. Um, the, the, the zoning calculators are, are relatively arbitrary. I mean, they, you have to make sure that the parking works, obviously, um, and that the massing is consistent with the surrounding neighborhood. But I think it, it would lend to simplification. Okay. Great. Thank you. Those are my, those are my questions. Okay, I'm going to call on myself. Um, so two questions, Carl. The first is, what do we lose by reducing open space in these developments? And by going to F and FAR, what do we lose? I mean, is, I'm sorry. And the second is, um, how does this, everything you're talking about is about um, smaller apartments in large scale developments. How does this get us to the kind of um, housing diversity and housing choices that the only housing choice surveys we have have told us that missing middle or middle income and in commuters want, which is not small apartments that they rent, but is in fact townhomes, single family homes if possible, townhomes or duplexes or triplexes that they can own. Um, I, I'm, I'm seeing a mismatch here between, um, you know, market rate, middle income housing, and just getting smaller units to generate smaller units. I'm just, so those are my two questions. On the open space question, I don't know that we're, we're missing much because like, I feel like where that 1200 square feet of open space per dwelling unit applies is in an area where we expect there to be more housing units and not in a more suburban context. We're not proposing to get rid of our standard open space per lot requirement as part of this. So what we have in the code right now is if you have a building that's under 35 feet tall, it's a 10% open space requirement on the site. And then if you go from 35 to 45, it goes up to 15%. And then if you go over 45, it's it's still gonna be a 20% open space requirement. So I don't think we lose much on the open space front. I, I think it's one less calculation. And a lot of times it's it's kind of a wash. I think the 1200- is, is, it, is that shared open space or does that include private balconies or private patios, just to clarify. It would be shared and then the private balconies can, can, can count for up to a quarter of that calculation. Okay. okay. So I don't, I don't look at that as, as much of a concern. Um, as far as the missing middle housing, I think it's kind of a factor of what do you want the intensity to be? Um, we're right now, we're, we need to do more analysis. We're not, this is baked. But I mean, we're looking at a 1.0 to a 1.5 FAR. So obviously that's not gonna allow, you know, big four story or five story buildings. We're, we're thinking that in these particular zones, like BR1 like already allows 2.0 to 3.0. And that's appropriate for those areas like, you know, around 29th street. Mm -hmm. But like in the neighborhood centers, we think there needs to be a lower FAR to fit in with the character of what's around it. So we're we're looking at a 1.0 to a 1.5 FAR. And I think with a lower FAR, I think it might be a better driver of, of those other types of housing types that is there are. A way to, is there a way to marry the lower FAR to a requirement or expectation of more than one type of housing? 
Um, that's an interesting point. I, uh, that's something we could look at. Okay. Just uh, when we get to the comments, I'll bring the, yeah. I'll bring up that issue. Um, are there any other questions right now, or shall we move forward? All right, let's move forward. Oh wait, Kurt has a question. Sorry. Um, you talk about specifically uh, the, a set of zoning districts, right? That you want to look at are BR one. RH5, BC2, BC1, BC2, IG, and IM. Uh, certainly the other, some of the other RH zones uh, have this same, the same problem that we've been talking about, same problem as RH5. And I think there's more RH2, it seems like, than any of the other RH zones. Uh, so you are looking at those other RHs? We, we've been asked, and this is a, on, a, on a slide coming up, but we've been asked by council to just investigate those other zones as well. I think we, we kind of hesitated to look at some of those zones just because like RH2 and RH4 in particular are ones that are usually adjacent to single family neighborhoods. Um, so we were, you know, more focused on the zones where you could get more intensity without impacting existing development. Um, but we are going to look at them just to kind of see if there are opportunities. And what about RMX? We're looking at that too. Okay. Okay. Thank I'm you. sorry, Carl, but this is, is this... This is not meant to be an exercise in upzoning the entire city. And that's what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues here, which is, hey, what about RMX? What about RMX2? What about RL? What about R? I mean, this is not meant to be an upzoning of the entire city. Is that correct? I mean, it, the focus is really removing zoning barriers to get more housing. So there might be more housing units that get built but it may not appear you know like added floor area or something like an upzoning in fact it might even be less far than what could be permitted today you just might get more housing okay mark um sarah i was just curious um I don't, I didn't interpret that anyone's advocating for uh, wholesale upzoning, uh, but I, I do go back to, um, and maybe staff can restate it or state it again, uh, council's direction to planning, to planning and development services staff was to evaluate the code or uh, maybe you could just state it again, what, the, what their mission was for you. It's to remove any kind of, to really look at simple changes to the code that could remove zoning barriers that stand in the way of, of more modest size housing basically, so that you can try to get more at that missing middle right, but instead of getting just larger units. But it's an assumption developed. that smaller houses in Boulder somehow will magically, or units will magically be less expensive. And we know that that is not the case. And, and we're getting, we're not in the comments section yet. So I don't, we don't need to get there, but um, I appreciate the restating of the purpose. I do too. Thanks. Okay, go ahead, Carl. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this. I, I think a lot of the comments we've gotten um, from the public are similar to what um, we got on occupancy, like uh, perspectives that um, adding more modest size housing will increase housing opportunities within um, the city and consistent with our goals. And that uh, opposing side finds that it may not make a difference and that the demand is high. I think a lot of this is pretty similar. We we have been hearing 
opposition and concern uh, from some folks in the single family neighborhoods uh, that are opposed to uh, allowing any housing types um, beyond um, just single family homes. Uh, so I think that's the one that stands out for this project. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the, the potential options that came from our analysis that we presented to council. So I won't spend too much time on it because we've already been talking about these except for the parking ones. Um, but looking at revising those density calculations in those set of zones that are in uh, areas that are anticipated for housing and then setting an FAR limit in those areas we've talked about, you know, it being 1.0 to 1 to 1.5 FAR. Um, we talked about the housing type allowance piece. Uh, we didn't recommend that this move forward with council. And I think in general, council was okay with that, but they said, you know, if you can find uh, opportunities, particularly in the uh, high density areas or even low density areas to look for those. So that's why we brought up the RL option uh, tonight. Um, and I'll talk more about what council told us. Uh, what I haven't focused so much on is just parking modifications, because that was part of the trying to remove zoning barriers. So uh, one thing that's been in the code for a while that we've we've been hearing feedback that it requires too much parking is there's a kind of a more antiquated parking requirement that requires 1.25 parking spaces uh, for every one bedroom unit in any kind of project that has more than 60% of its units as one bedroom. So uh, we're proposing to change that to just one space per one bedroom unit. Um, that's kind of like a low hanging fruit change we can make. Um, we're, we're also looking at a procedural change where um, we do process up to 25% parking reductions in commercial projects, but we don't do that for residential projects. All residential projects uh, require site review. So we're looking at potentially um, making an administrative process for a residential parking reduction up to 25%. So these are the options that we presented to, to council. Uh, next slide, please. So we went to housing advisory board on March 22nd. Um, the board largely supported the potential options, the recommended options that, that staff brought. Um, they did express some disappointment that the scope couldn't include more missing middle housing and more infill. Uh, in the single family neighborhoods, uh, similar to you know what we heard uh, with some in council. Um, they supported any kind of process that might um, go into the next BVCP update to really re-envision some areas of the city to um, allow more housing, more um, kind of like what we're seeing at the state level. Um, some felt that we, we should make more aggressive changes uh, to the parking uh, code to uh, encourage more affordable housing. And the next slide shows uh, what council talked to us on the following day, March 23rd. Um, so council agreed with all the staff re recommended options about revising the density calculations in those zones. Uh, like I said, they wanted us to look at additional high density residential zones uh, for changes. Um, there were some council members that did want us to look more at the single family zone. So again, that's why we raised um, the RL zones. Uh, so we want your feedback on that tonight. Um, we're also proposing to remove um, a use review requirement for ELUs. Um, right now, if you have more than, um, I think, 40% of the units as ELUs, it requires a use review. Uh, we think this is unnecessary, especially since we recently changed the site review criteria that you looked at that an ELU project still requires at least two housing types already in the criteria. So we just don't find that the use review process is necessary. Um, so we're proposing that that be eliminated. Uh, they supported that. Uh, they supported the change to the one bedroom requirement. They supported the administrative review for residential parking reductions and even asked that maybe we allow more than 25% for both residential and non-residential projects through an administrative process. So that's where we are with city council. And I think the next slide just takes us to the question related to board feedback. Um, so in the interest of time, because everyone's getting tired and we still have one more thing we have to deal with. Um, I'm just gonna suggest that everybody just, I'm gonna call on you, please go through your list of comments and feedback and we'll speed through this, take a quick break and then come back and do this last item. So who would like to go first? 
Kurt? Uh, generally, I support the project. I think it's great. Um, I uh, I feel like uh, when we're talking about open space, I think I, I have doubts about the value of private open space. I think we need more public open space, especially park space rather than private open space. And so I think that this moves us more in that direction, which I think is great. Um, on the parking, um, I would, uh, I support reducing the parking requirements. Um, I think that uh, the, there, are, there are currently, uh, there's a different scale of parking requirements between like RMX2 and some similar uh, zone districts and the more high intensity ones. And I would suggest that we move all of them to the lower level. Uh, and I can give you the details if you are interested. Uh, I think that all the parking reductions really should be administrative with a potential appeal to planning board. Um, so I support that aspect. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Laura, then Mark. Thank you. Um, and and by the way, Carl, thank you for the really great presentations, both of them. I, I think that probably goes unsaid, but it should be said as well. So thank you so much. Um, I'll be quick here and say I resonated with everything that Hab said. I was really vibing with all of Hab's comments. Same thing with City Council. I uh, agree with all of the things that they supported. Um, this new piece about allowing duplexes or triplexes rather than subdividing in RL, RR, and RE if I got that right. Um, am I understanding correctly that that would mean they basically trade away their right to subdivide and instead they would have the option of doing a duplex or a triplex, whatever the amount of land that they own would allow? Yes. Okay. I would say that I'm cautiously supportive of that. I would want to wait and see what happens with the state bill. Um, just simple math, the state bill, if it goes through, any single family home could be turned into a duplex or a triplex, you know, again, depending upon our intensity standards. And so if they were able to subdivide and then the state bill allows them to also do a duplex, that gives us more units of housing than if we just allow them to do a duplex or a triplex instead of subdividing, if, if my math is right there. So I think I'm cautiously supportive. I would definitely want to see what happens with the state bill first before we, we go there and make them trade away their right to subdivide. Um, but if the state bill doesn't pass, then I'm absolutely that if that provision in the state bill doesn't pass, then I'm absolutely supportive of giving homeowners the option to do um, a more efficient duplex or triplex one building rather than spreading it out on the lot. And, and that might make some, like you said, with certain situations with like grade, you know, gradient or whatever, or easements or something, it might make more housing possible if they can concentrate that housing in one part of the lot. Um, and then my last comment has to do with the parking reductions. Like I said, I'm I'm supportive of the administrative review provision. I'm supportive of going from 1.25 to 1. I think we tend to grant parking reductions almost every time they are brought to us. The one thing that I think planning board adds that is of great value that I would really like to see staff um, push hard on, I would like to see you push just as hard on robust TDM plans, because if we are going to reduce parking requirements, we need the developers to be contributing in not just superficial and standard ways to other kinds of transit, but really contributing to a walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented city as best they can with, with their property. So really, really robust TDMs. So that's my comments. That's all I have. Mark? Um, well, Laura said my comments and said them better than I, I could have. So that was that's great. On parking, I would go one step further and say that uh, site, the site review process is subjective. Uh, in some regards, so is an administrative review. And so in looking at parking requirements, just take it as far as we can in terms of not uh, building more car storage, but building more housing. And, um, and and incorporate that into the code without 
review it all. Um, and at the same time, though, we're giving up a lever by doing that of what Laura pointed out was the need for uh, review for robust TDM plans. So uh, I realize there's a trade off there. Um, but anyway, taking it up to as far as your the community really feels comfortable with uh, to achieve our more housing goals. I think we ought to do it in the code. Um, finally, I just want to say that this is an, is an opportunity for simplification. And if we can incorporate additional simplification into this project, um, all the better. ML and then George. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I have three comments. Thank you, Carl, for your, <laughs> there, there were some just like really very concise, very um, clear slides that, that showed some, this is complicated. It can get complicated really fast. So I really appreciate your um, bringing it graphically. That helps understand it. I, I've got three points, um, three feedbacks. Uh, you know, I think, I think, and I and I know it sounds like they're hesitancy to get the R's involved, but um, I think that's low hanging fruit. That's where we're going to get the middle the middle housing is by the RL, RR, and RE um, allowing plexes by right. I think. I think that's a game changer. You know, you talked about 800 units potentially out of that. Um, so I would absolutely encourage um, looking at that capacity. Um, as far as the parking goes, uh, I, I would say that reduced parking should be a staff level approval. Parking requirements are trending to being abolished nationally. All over cities are, are removing parking requirements. It's kind of putting it in the hands of um, the developers is how much parking are you going to need in order to make your project a viable parking. And that doesn't seem to have any, um, I have not seen any statistics on that having uh, backfired. So I, I'm, I'm good with let's make it easy to reduce parking. And I think big picture, um, we should have our sights on changing uh, BBCP's density intensity standards to allow more housing by right. And, you know, the state policy might push our hand in that direction anyway, but I think we should, we should have it on our radar that um, that needs to be looked at so that we can get more housing by right. We're not making it harder, we're making it easier. And those are my comments. Thank you so much. George. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little tired. Uh, so I'm gonna keep this uh, uh, really brief. Um, I, I don't know if I'm, I, generally I'm supportive of the project. I, not entirely on board with losing all that open space requirement. Um, I, I think um, I think that should be considered a little bit more, and, and the value of that open space, and just just understanding that a little bit more, I think would be helpful. And then on the parking, uh, I generally agree. I do think we're in an interesting moment where we've got infrastructure issues around electric cars, and that's going to get worse, not better, for the next sort of decade. Um, uh, I, you know, I've got my own electric car pro charging problems right now because we, we, we only have one off street parking space and we've got two uh, electric vehicles. Um, and I, I do think, and you can't charge an electric vehicle on the, on city streets. Currently you can't drag a cord across the sidewalk. It's a hazard. It's, it's not, not proper. It's illegal. Um, and so, um, I, I'm a little concerned about, I, the way I read this is that basically um, we're reducing it down to one per bedroom and then staff has the ability to cut it down to 0.75 per bedroom. And I just, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm totally fine with parking reductions. I just don't want to trade it for free to kind of to what Laura, I think Laura said 
um, something about you know making sure there are robust TDM plans. So um, and and I feel like what will end up happening is kind of what happens today, which is what is in staff's purview kind of gets eaten away in that process. Um, and I don't know if the trade is as good for Boulder as it could be if it went through planning board. So it's, it's, it's a thought process around negotiating with a developer and making sure we maximize the leverage that we have rather than making it an assumption that they're gonna get 0.75 per unit because that's what staff's allowed to do and that's what gets done. Um, so that that's kind of a comment. I don't I don't have a I don't have a, a cure to that, but I, I wouldn't want to reduce it further than that, um, specifically because I I think there is a place for planning board to question those types of things to uh, to enable us to get a little bit more from the developer. Thank you, Lisa. Do you have anything? No, I I think I really agree. Actually, I'm. Um grateful to hear from everyone else. I, I think overall, I really agree with what Georgie just said. That there's just, like, I'm, I'm broadly kind of feel positively about it. I think it's going in a good direction. Um, and I just worry about some of the stuff in terms of what it'll do. I, I, electric cars or something I think about constantly. I'm just like, where is it we're going to put them? Um, and I don't think that necessarily means that parking has to say exactly the same or that you can't reduce or even eliminate parking minimums. You know, maybe you get rid of a bit of parking minimums and you put in a charging requirement or something. Um, but, you know, I think I think we've got to figure out how we're going to handle that. Um, so I wouldn't want that piece to get lost. And otherwise, yeah, I think things I would say have already been touched on, so nothing further to add. Anyone who hasn't gone other than me? All right, then I will go. Um, so I have a problem with uh, the fact that this is being that what's being proposed essentially continues to move us in the direction of rentals um, and uh, with that are not necessarily and not necessarily creating any home ownership opportunities. We have no idea because we haven't updated our housing choice surveys in 10 years. We have no idea whether the type of housing that's being proposed that would be buildable under the new F that we're using FAR rather than density uh, would meet the needs of middle income families and uh, in commuters, which are the two communities, the two populations that we say we care about housing. My personal suggestion, I know this city council really wants to push stuff through super fast because they have an agenda they wanna push through but we're doing it again with kind of limited data. And I think before we do anything, we need to conduct new housing choice surveys so that we know that the changes we're making will result in the kind of housing that people now want, not the kind of housing people we think people should live in, <laughs> but the kind of housing people actually want. Um, secondly, um, I kind of feel like um, the proposal, I, I don't really have a problem with the FAR approach um, as long as it allows for a diversity of housing types, particularly in the BC1 and BC2 zones, which have a, during the use table review or use table update, has, the opportunity that has been reimagined is, you know, dense, diverse, developments that have housing and retail and public space and a diversity of housing types so that you have a real neighborhood that is a center <laughs> that the surrounding more single family home neighborhoods turn to as their 15 minute neighborhood or their 25 minute neighborhood. Um, and I'm concerned that using the FAR without some other components that push for more than one housing type, not dwelling type, but housing type. I think that's very important, especially if we want to advance um, BVCP goal 710, which is housing for a full range of households, or 712, permanently affordable housing, and 717, market affordability. Um, uh, I'm a little, I'm, I am concerned that in moving to the FAR, we're going to lose adequate livable open space. I happen to disagree with Kurt that private open space doesn't matter. I think if we learned anything during COVID is that it does. Um, and um, it doesn't have to be a lot, but some private open space um, 
uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, parking. Okay, only Lupita were here. <laughs> Lupita would talk about the equity component of parking, especially in low and moderate income neighborhoods. Um, as we learned during the Ponderosa process, uh, low and moderate income individuals and families, often their car or their truck is their job. It is where they do their work from. And to um, be reducing, uh, to, to focus on reducing uh, parking without thinking about the needs of uh, the folks in those communities is to completely ignore their needs. And, and we have to make sure we don't do that. I totally agree with George. I said it before in, in terms of um, in the, the other issue, which has to do with the offloading of um, building charging, a charging network onto the city, which will mean an offloading onto taxpayers is something I think we need to be thinking long and hard about before we do, before we do that. Um, and uh, carry over John's voice in terms of the RL, RR, and RE. Um, if he were here, I think he would talk about people purchase somewhere or live somewhere believing that they bought, they are living in a neighborhood that has a certain density, a certain feel, whatever it may be. Maybe it's very urban, maybe it's very rural. And um, what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues is let's see if we can use this very speedy process to try to push that through without having the kind of, I don't think people are saying don't have public input, but this is a very speedy process that is not going to allow us and not, not allow folks who live in RL, RR, RE, which I do not live in. I actually live in RMX too. <laughs> Won't give them very much time to respond to. And I don't think that's an appropriate thing for us to be doing. And I don't think it's an appropriate thing for city council to be doing. Um, and I think that's, those are my comments. Sarah, can I just ask you to clarify, you said um, housing types, not dwelling types, and how do you differentiate between those? Between, uh, under the city code, they're probably the same thing, but I mean, not one bedroom and two bedrooms, but townhomes and condos and duplexes and apartments. That's what I mean. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments? All right, so we have one last item to do. Carl, thank you very, very much. Really yeah. appreciate everything that you've done so far. Um, it's great, it's interesting, it's challenging. And uh, you always take on the big, the big projects. So we have one last item. Um, let's not take a break. If you need to get up and do a bio break, just go do it. Um, Hella is going to walk us through what sounds very complex, but is actually ultimately a very simple ask of us. Yeah, and I apologize. I have to run. I've got a plumbing emergency that I've got to. <laughs> okay, George, with. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye, you guys. Bye. All right, Hella, take it away. All right. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Let me share the screen. Oops, and my screen kind of moved all of you from my screen. Can you guys see my slideshow? Yes, we can. See you, you. Yeah. All right. Does it have a bar on top of it that said, you know, that has kind of the bottom of the? No, zoom? it has twenty-one fifty Folsom subdivision final plat clarification of findings of fact and conclusions of law. Okay. Then, um, then only I see that that bar and um, I'm fine with that. <laughs> um, thanks for hanging in there with me uh, this late in the evening. This is a very unusual item to come in front of the planning board. I don't think any of you have seen this particular request before. Um, and it is actually coming out of a court order in a legal challenge of the city's approval of the 2150 Folsom subdivision final plat. Um, the court in that particular legal case that the city is a part of asked the city to make an additional uh, finding of fact on a final plat application requirement. And it really is just 
on one of the many criteria that apply in a final plat application that the court asks you to, to make a finding today. And this is the criterion on the screen here, C2. So a, a subdivision is approved in a two-step process. First, a preliminary plat is approved, and then a final plat is approved. Um, both preliminary and final plats require a current title report or return a memorandum based on an abstract of title. This all relates just to the final plat, but I'm mentioning this because you, as you can see on the screen, the language says an update to the preliminary title report or attorney memorandum. And really we're talking about a title report here because that's what was submitted to meet this requirement. But it talks about an update to the preliminary report because there was a requirement already under the, pre under the preliminary plat application. So the way I'm gonna, go through this today is I'm gonna do just uh, to show you the site where it's located at, do a brief review of the regulatory application history, and then discuss this one key issue, which is defining on that one final plat uh, review criterion. And then I'll give you a staff recommendation. So this is an aerial view of the site that we're talking about and that was subdivided under this final plat approval. It consisted of two platted lots, two parcels that are a platted a ditch corridor and an alley. And it's just directly east of Folsom and between Pine and Spruce Street. The board saw this um, an application for this project prior to, fin for the, prior to the final plat application because a site review application was filed and the planning board approved it in June of 2019. Um, before the development started, there was a single family dwelling unit on this entire property, nothing else. And the site review approved a redevelopment with eight attached dwelling units. After the site review approval, uh, there were a few additional steps required, including vacation of the alley that was proposed to be developed with this, that was approved by city council, and then technical documents and pre a preliminary plat were approved by staff um, in 2020, just before staff made a decision on the final plat. So originally, the final plat was approved by staff. And you were, I think, all familiar with that process. Final staff, uh, final plats are typically approved by staff. That's followed by a 14 day call up period or a PETA period in which either a member of the planning board can call up the decision on the final plat or it can be appealed by, the member of, by a member of the public. In this case, uh, none of the board members chose to call up staff's decision, but there was an appeal by the public. And because of that, the planning board held a public hearing on July 30th, 2020, and ultimately approved the plat. Then council had an opportunity to call up that approval, but did not do so. Following the final plat approval, neighboring property owners filed a Rule 106 proceeding. A Rule 106 proceeding is a proceeding in which somebody can challenge the decision of a governmental body in a quasi-judicial proceeding based on the argument that the body who made the decision either misapplied the law or abused its discretion. So here the argument was that the city misapplied the law when it found that the title report submitted by the applicant met the final plat requirements of the voter revised code. The plaintiffs argued that a title report must be based on an abstract of title. In 2021, the district court issued a judgment on that Rule 106 action and ruled in favor of the city, finding well, that the city did not misapply the law and did not abuse it, its discretion um, when it interpreted the plat requirements such that a title report does not have to be based on an abstract of title and found that the title report that was submitted satisfied code requirements. 
district court decisions can be appealed through the to the Colorado Court of Appeals, and the plaintiffs in the case chose to do that. So that is um, where the the decision that we're acting on today came from. The Court of Appeals reviewed the challenge and first considered the argument that, that the plaintiff made that a title report under the code has to be based on an abstract of title. So that's really a question of interpretation of the law and the court agreed with the district court that Boulder's code should be interpreted such, and must be interpreted such that only if an applicant chooses to comply with the code requirement through an attorney memorandum, that memorandum has to be based on an abstract of title. But if a title report is submitted, that does not have to be based on an abstract of title. That was consistent with what the city had argued during the case. Um, the city took the position that this is how the code should be interpreted and has been interpreted in the past. But there was some evidence in the record um, that led the Colorado Courts of Appeals to think that it is possible that the city may have misinterpreted the law so that the title report has to, had to be based on an abstract of title and also that the city thought that it was based on an abstract of title and it wasn't sure what the city's position was because the record was a little bit unclear on that. And the court didn't wanna make a decision without giving the city another opportunity to make new findings now that it has then been determined that the title report doesn't have to be based on an abstract of title. So very technical stuff here. So that's the premise of um, why, why we're here today. And your only key issue is whether the title report that was actually submitted by the applicant meets the final plat requirement under section 912.8 C2. So in a way, this is an extension of the decision that was previously made by the planning board quasi-judicial procedures. You have to make your decision based on the evidence that's in the record. Um, and that was submitted to you with, with the memo that was here. And, and as you know, that consists of the memo that staff prepares, um, applicant materials that were submitted with the application, um, any testimony that occurred and any um, evidence that was submitted for the hearing by members of the public. Hella, could you put up the um, potential motion language again? Yeah, I actually haven't gotten to that yet. Oh, okay, sorry. My last slide, but... I, um, I wanted to summarize what the, what the evidence in the report is, and I know that's also in the memo, and, and there are a lot of attachments, but um, I have a few slides that summarize um, the evidence that was there, and then I'll go to the recommendation and the motion language. So the title report that was submitted by the applicant is attached to your memory as attachment A, and it identifies the things that are typically part of a title report. Um, in this case, it identifies three parcels that were to be subdivided in the legal description titled to those three parcels, as well as um, who those titles are vested in. So it was for parcels one and two, Folsom LLC, and as to parcel three, that was the ditch corridor parcels, it was Folsom LLC and also James Tyrell. And those people were also then listed as owners on the final plat. Uh, what, was the, what else was there in terms of evidence that um, might show or be evidence against whether the title report that was submitted and called title report is a title report that meets the plat requirements. The title report was issued by a title insurance company. It includes all the information that's typically included in such a title report is ownership status, we just discussed encumbrances and um, other relevant elements to the legal history. It states that it is a title report and it is not a commitment to insure. 
one of the things that um, the plaintiff put a lot of weight on is that it also stated that Fidelity, the insurance company who issued the report, assumes no liability under the document unless a policy of insurance is issued um, and that the information is furnished for informational purposes only. In addition, there was some extensive limited, uh, limit of liability language at the end of the report. And to some extent, it was contradictory language within the report itself, because it stated that it is limited in scope and it's not an abstract of title. Um, and I don't think anybody said that it was an abstract of title, but it also, amongst other things, states that it's not a title report. So that's a little bit odd. Um, and that's all language that's at the end of the title report. Then staff provided additional information um, during the staff presentation. Um, it, staff provided you information that the city has in the past found that this type of title report does satisfy the final plat requirements. Um, staff had talked with Fidelity staff um, and was informed that the report was actually based on the same type of research that Fidelity uses to issue title insurances and that it's produced in this form and the purpose is not to ensure the property, but for development review purposes. Staff also stated that these types of reports typically have broad disclaimer language because it's not a policy to ensure. And that was in reference to that um, boilerplate language at the end of the report that had the contradictory language and stated that it's not a title report. The applicant's attorney testified and mentioned that there have been four different statements by the title company that also were evidence of the validity of title of the property, including a title commitment and an actual title insurance policy. And with regard to evidence to the contrary, the neighbor's attorney testified and stated um, that the neighbors dispute the fee simple determinable title as to the ditch parcels and argued that no court has determined title and that because of that, in this case, this title, this, the title report, um, including the language that it includes, should not be considered a title report that meets the code and should not be relied on. Staff originally recommended that the title report does satisfy re the requirements of section 912.8c2 and has not changed its position. And it's supported by the fact that by its title and form, the evidence that it was created based on the same type of research performed for an abstract of title or title insurance, um, that title insurance itself is not required by the code. It's, a title report that it's that is required. And while a report does not itself insure title or create liability for the insurance company, it does present evidence of current ownership of the property. And finally, the code requires that it's a current report and here it was issued within 30 days of the board's final plat hearing and that's the city's typical requirement. So based on all that, um, staff recommends that the board find that the final flat approval was based on, on the title report. Actually, I'm losing my, <laughs> my thought here and my thread. That's the motion language. I'm, I'm just gonna read it to you and then I'll open it up to questions and um, to your discussion. So the, the recommended motion language is to find that the final plat approval was based on the title report submitted by the applicant, that the title report prov provided for purposes of meeting the final plat requirements of section 912.8c2 does not have to be based on an abstract of title, and that the title report that was submitted satisfies the final plat requirements of section 912.8c2, and that the board therefore reaffirms its approval of the final plat under TechDoc 2020-00005 as made on July 30th, 2020 and incorporates the staff memorandum as findings of fact. With that, I'm opening up. Anyone questions? have questions? Are there questions? No, wait, someone raised, Mark. Yes. <clears throat> 
Uh, I, I read the appeals court, not all of it, but a, a good portion of the appeals court ruling. And a, a lot of their, uh, a lot of the appeals court's findings really come down to uh, grammar, antecedents, pre precedents, and commas. And my question is, um, is this one of those things where we need to update our code and it could be a really, it doesn't even need to come, I don't know if it need to come before planning board, but do, we, but do we need to update our code to avoid this um, misunderstanding of what's required uh, in future uh, final plot approvals? Yeah, that's a good question, Mark. For this purpose today, the court directed you to make a finding consistent with their finding and from now on, um, the code should be interpreted consistent with that court ruling. But I agree with you that when we have the opportunity to clarify that language, I think we should do so. Okay, and so has the city incurred uh, legal fees outside <clears throat> of the city's internal legal staff and office? Um, the city has not hired any outside counsel, but I believe the city may have to pay part of the legal fees of the plaintiffs. And let me take a quick look because I think that was at the end of the... Well, it, it's... Um, is that... Is it, that it's actually, they, they say you're going to... It, it's almost uh, like another issue that the attorney's fees uh, for for the neighbors, uh, whether or not the city or the applicant has to pay. The, the appeals court found that it wasn't frivolous. Their, their demands were not frivolous. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I, I was just curious if we had to go out and hire attorneys outside of our internal staff? No, we have not. Um, Luis Toro, our litigation attorney, has handled this mainly. And, okay. and now I'm just, I'm looking at um, the order and it actually, it was, the, the applicant has also been involved and is a party to the case and they were seeking attorney's fees from plaintiffs. Mm. And so that's what, what I was remembering. So it wasn't actually an order um, as it relates to the city. And, and so is, would you, uh, I'm going to say what I think the appeals court has said, which is, hey, the city did misinterpret and did, you know, should have used a comma uh, like an Oxford comma, so that these modifiers work this way. But we're not we're not siding with the neighbors, even though we've overturned the lower court's ruling. We're simply saying the city has to go back and do it again, and that's what we're doing right now. Yes, I I think there were two challenges. One was based on the interpretation of the law and how that's supposed to be interpreted and then how the facts are, the second challenge is how the facts are applied to that. And the um, appellate court has so far only ruled on the issue of how the law has to be interpreted and looked at the record and said, we think it's possible that the city decision is based on a misapplication of the law. Now, I can tell you what I believe the court based that on. It was a statement by staff that said that, said that um, the title report was based on abstract of title research. And then there was another statement that was actually in the call up memo to city council. Um, so it summarized the board decision, but it was not actually something the, the, the board said because the board didn't actually go into a detailed discussion about that. It was more of a summary finding. So it was a combination of those two factors that made the Court of Appeals think 
the city might have actually relied on this false interpretation of the law. So we want to hear what the city has to say now that we tell the city how it has to be interpreted. Okay, those are those are my questions, and I'll I'll, I'll just make a comment now, and then I'll be done. That it this does speak to um, the uh, the requirement for precision in in uh, in in the writing of code, the updating of code, and in the use of punctuation and grammar, uh, because it, the way I read this, it's really that's that's a lot of what this is this is about. So I'm all for that precision. Um, Kurt. Yeah, I agree that it would be great to uh, clarify nine, twelve, eight, and also the the similar language in for preliminary plats in nine, twelve, six. In the the appeals court decision actually had an interesting history of the code, and it sounds like the code used to be clear in this matter, and then we updated it and made it more confusing, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Yeah, and it's not the first time that I've actually seen that happen. I think there's an attempt maybe to simplify and shorten the language. And right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, the other question, though, is about the title report that says it's not a title report. <laughs> that, that seems problematic. And in going forward, if we get something like that, should we say no, ask for another title report that doesn't have this confusing, this contradictory language in it or something like that? Well, I think today you're asked to make a decision of if this title report does meet that requirement. Right. Yeah, sorry. I was I was trying to think about avoiding this similar problems in the future, which mm -hmm. I, is getting beyond what we're specifically asked to address today. I, I guess it would, again, I'm trying to avoid these, these future problems and not getting title reports that say they're not title reports would be helpful. I'll leave yeah. it. All right, Lisa. I think what, tell me if I understood this correctly, Hella. What I understood is that by introducing this motion and passing this motion, in addition to addressing what we were asked to do by the appellate court, that we are also laying down case law such that the code as currently written shall be interpreted this way moving forward. And that while it sure would be nice to make things look real pretty and put commas where we want them and so on, et cetera, um, that this would kind of, excuse my French, cover our asses for the moment and like allow us to just move forward. Um, is that a fair interpretation that, that this would then kind of provide that precedent of this is how the code is interpreted and unless and until we correct or beautify the code um, that we should be fine? Yeah, that's how I generally would look at it, yeah. Cool, then I would like to invite my fellow members of the board. I don't wanna shut down conversation. It is now 1033 at night on a Tuesday. Unless you have something darn good to say, um, I would love for us to swiftly move to uh, introducing this and considering passing it and not worry so much about how we're gonna fix it in the future, other than that we definitely want to fix things like this in the future because it's no fun to have to do this at 1030 at night. All right, does someone want to make a motion? All right, Mark, why don't you make the motion? Wait, you're, you're muted, Mark. I move to find that the final plat approval was based on the title report submitted by the applicant that a title report provided for purposes of meeting the final plat requirements of section 9-12-8C2 does not have to be based on an abstract of title 
and that the title report that was submitted satisfies the final plat requirements of section 9-12-8C2, comma, BRC 1981. And the board therefore reaffirms its approval of the final plat under TEC 2020-00005 as made on July 30th, 2020, and incorporates the staff memorandum as findings of fact. Okay, do we have a second? I will second. Thank you. Do, is there any discussion? If no discussion, I will reread the motion and then we can vote on it. Motion to find that the final plat approval was based on the title report submitted by the applicant, that a title report provided for purposes of meeting the final plat reports as requirements of section 9-12-8C2 does not have to be based on abstractive title and that the title report that was submitted satisfies the final plat requirements of section 9-12-8C2 BRC 1981. And the board therefore reaffirms its approval of the final plat under tax 2020 0005 as made on July 30th, 2020, and incorporates the staff memorandum as finding of facts. All right, ML. I thank you, Kurt. Couldn't find my microphone. Yes. <laughs> that was very suspenseful. Kurt. Yes. Lisa? Aye. Mark? Aye. Laura? Yay. Sarah, I, I passed this 6-0. Thank you, Hella, for walking us through that and um, for being such a good lawyer. All right. And if I if I may just uplift the comment that Kurt made, it sounds like there is a parallel section of code that is slightly different, um, but has the same comma problem that would not be fixed by this motion. So just wanted to uplift that. I'm sure staff is following along. And yeah, and and uh, I, I think what Mark was talking about is to, in one of our next code updates when, you know, sometimes we have cleanup ordinances where we fix things like this that we find where we can clarify the code. Those, both of those code sections um, were put on our list to clarify. Okay, thank you. All right, Brad, do you have anything for us? I, just this. Uh, thank you again for your time and uh, contribution for the on the community's behalf. I will be seeing all or most of you tomorrow evening. I'm not quite sure of the RSVP list. Um, I did want to mention uh, there was some discussion earlier in the day about housing um, and CU's role and responsibility in that, and, and this is offered without uh, you know expressing an opinion that, but we are getting. Um, recent updates on their master plan, uh, which includes some housing, including uh, updating the graduate housing north of the uh, Boulder Creek. So um, I, we may have some summaries that we can provide to council in that regard. And um, uh, just wanted to make you aware of that. So that's all I've got. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, Devin, is there anything we need you need to tell us? Nothing for me, thank you. Hella, anything else you need to tell us? Nothing for me, thank you. All right, Mark, what do you have for us? Um, I, I was going to ask tonight, but it's too late. It's late tonight. Uh, and it, at our next meeting or at, at, at a soonish date, um, I would love to hear an update on the Alpine Balsam Project. Lots of activity there. And people ask me all the time, well, you're on planning board. What's actually going to happen there? And I, after having been involved in the early stages of it, I, I have to say, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly. And so I would love, uh, and it doesn't have to be a big presentation or anything, but just a verbal update at our next meeting uh, under matters from staff or whatever. I would find that helpful. And if anyone else would, I, that would be great. I actually can give you a very quick update, which is there there have been no decisions made as to the programming or functions. In fact, I've got meetings coming up for that. Uh, the earliest construction that I've heard on that is 2025. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Laura. 
I'm not going to go into any details, but I just want to report back as the airport liaison that I think staff heard our feedback and have incorporated it to a large extent. And I can give you more details about that at our next meeting when people are more awake. But I just wanted to go ahead and credit staff and appreciate them and um, show my gratitude for them listening to us and other folks who gave input and making some changes. So I just wanted to give that really brief update. Okay, anyone else? No. All right. I am closing out this meeting. Good night, everyone. We'll see you next Tuesday. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.